Good day, Derek. So, so is your microphone on, Neil? Yeah. See, you can just chat, mm -hmm. and all the jokes that I make, you can laugh. Ah, oh, what was the funniest joke we told this morning on our morning coffee live stream? The polar bear one, I think. Yeah, that was so good. Please tell us that one again. And right. Neil, I want to get an example of you laughing okay, at this. Absolutely. All right, so go. just reset, uh, cleanse your palate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So a polar bear walks into a bar and he sits down and uh, the bartender's just so enamored that this polar bear made a pilgrimage to his bar, his pub. He says, buddy, whatever you want. It's on the house, man. Whatever, Just whatever you want, order it. And the polar bear says, okay, I will have a rum and Coke. And the bartender says, absolutely, it's no problem. But I got to ask you, man, why the big paws? And he says, because I'm a polar bear. <laughs> That's good. He's not even laughing. Neil's dead on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was such a good joke. The, the, the trick would be, uh, what would be fun is just seeing how long you can hold that pause before the... And just blank The stare. recipient of the joke can no longer take it. I thought it was good. I don't know why I didn't laugh. Sorry. <laughs> it was too good. I, was you, laughing. You I, I need to hire somebody else just to laugh. <laughs> Get a laugh We track. need to find somebody else to just sit there and laugh. The, the pints laugh track. So I noticed you have your ring chot key. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's cute. It is cute. You're, you're <laughs> over. Just, just trying to get. Uh, all right. Hey, listen, before we get going, I want to let people know that at the start of the new year, I had an idea that all of these interviews and debates would be available um, early access to my supporters because I love them and they're all beautiful and canonizable. Um, but then I asked them what they wanted. And if you're a supporter, this is you. And the majority of people were like, we don't care about early access because we, you know, it's not like I have three hours to sit around and watch your live stream anyway. So from now on, what we're going to be doing is post-show wrap-up videos where we take questions from our supporters on Patreon and locals. And uh, so that video will be up today if you're a supporter. If you're not yet a supporter, please feel free to support us by going to pintswithaquinas.com slash pints. So now that that's out of the way, the other thing I have to say is that Exodus 90 is sponsoring the show and um, you only have a few days to make the decision as to whether or not you're going to do it. So Exodus 90 is an aesthetical program for men who take 90 days fasting from many things, taking on uh, many ascetical practices like cold showers um, and things like that. It's done communally with a small group of men. So click the link in the description below, exodus90.com slash Matt, exodus90.com slash Matt. And the reason you only have a few days to, to figure out whether you're doing this or not is because there's going to be thousands of men on the 17th of January, three days, who are going to begin Exodus 90. Why the 17th of January, I hear you ask. I didn't ask that. I feel you asking <clears throat> through your gaze at me. Well, the reason is because it ends on Easter Sunday. So go to exodus90.com slash Matt to learn more. It's only for dudes. So if you are a dude, uh, check it out. Exodus90.com slash Matt. They do discriminate. If you are a <laughs> Sheila, you cannot join. But if you're a bloke who's considering it, exodus90.com slash Matt. Click the link in the description <laughs> below. Uh, Derek, it's great to have you. It's great to be had. Um, uh, it's Who's really it? good to have you, man. Yeah. I, I uh, like you a lot. You're very funny. We're, we've become friends uh, since I've moved to Steubenville. You live in, in the Berg, the Pittsburgh. Is that what they, do they call it the Berg? Nobody calls it that. I call it, we call it the Ville. But we did, growing up, call Steubenville the Burb of the Berg. <laughs> we did, growing up, call Steubenville that crap city. Whoa! I did, your words, not mine. Yeah, no, I love it. Um, and I'm just, here's why I'm so excited for this show today. Even though you are an orthodox catechumen, mm -hmm. you are still discerning, in some sense, between orthodoxy and Catholicism. And you and I have been saying, you know, there's so many videos out there where people are like, I saw the light and now I'm this, which is great. But there's a lot of people who are legitimately confused about what to do. And so today's episode, not to disappoint people, but it's not going to be about me trying to talk you into Catholicism. It's just going to be talking about what it's like discerning between two faith systems and not being entirely sure what to do. And I think this will be beneficial if you're watching today. Maybe you're an atheist considering Christianity and you're not sure what to do. And you're trying to make yourself decide one way or the other. One day you feel one way, one day you feel the other, but you can't seem to. Maybe you're discerning between Protestantism and Catholicism, Catholicism and Orthodoxy. That kind of like inner tension and, and just journey that I think a lot of people are on is something that doesn't often get highlighted. So that is why I'm excited to have you on the show today. I appreciate it, man. Yeah. yeah. Now, give us a bit of your background because, I mean, starting <laughs> with being a Protestant youth pastor, at least. You want me to start there? You want me to start with... Uh... When I was three. <laughs> yeah. So I, came, I came into the world <laughs> naked, screaming, and covered in blood. <laughs> 
like everybody does. And it, it's only gotten worse <laughs> since then. <laughs> I, I can start with that, or if you want me to start with like how I became a Christian in sure. the first place. Let's do it. Which is kind of a long, drawn out story. But um, so I grew up nom- fairly nominally Christian, I would say. My family, my grandparents belonged to the Church of the Nazarene, which I thought until recent history was the church from Footloose. Turns out I was wildly wrong. Okay. But never seen Footloose. Just pretend it is. Okay. Um, so we would go, you know, maybe Christmas and Easter randomly with my grandparents. I mostly ate cookies and drew pictures with crayons and went down into the basement which had like a weird green carpet and like toys that were missing eyes and stuff. So it was kind of <laughs> like Toy Story. Um, so I kind of hit this point eventually where it, it didn't feel like it had any impact on my life. <clears throat> no bearing either way. Um, so I kind of wrote it off in high school and kind of did the whole sex, drugs and rock and roll bit. And would say really classic, e- classic, really edgy and cool things yeah. like God's an imaginary friend for old people, you know, because I thought that made me cooler. Yeah. And um, so, you know, eventually went to college as as you do and stayed with the same kind of friends. Like all of my friends just were getting high all the time and drunk. And within one semester, every friend that I had dropped out or transferred. So I had no friends. And my advisor said, you should hang out with these people. They're in your major. They're in the music department. And they just wanted to go to chapel all the time. And I was like, I guess I'll go with them, you know, whatever. But there was this life about them that was that was attractive, you know. Um, so that kind of started things. Was it a evangelical sort of school? Yeah. So it was <clears throat> affiliated with the Presbyterian Church. Okay. I think it was PCUSA. There's two Presbyterian churches. Yeah. I can't remember which one's which. I um, so yeah, kind of got into that. And then I was at least warmed up to the idea of faith at that point. Um, and then the summer between my junior and senior year, my band went on tour. Nice. And just like a two Name week, of the band? Oh gosh. It was called Round Hand Rowan. That's awesome. I love yeah, that name. It's based on Norse mythology as That's all good cool. metal bands are. Mine was Stitchwork Ninjas. Which yeah, is also good. That's pretty good. Yeah. We briefly changed it to Carcosa because okay. we thought that was cooler. What does that mean? Uh, just a made up word? Or? That's from, well, we knew it from True Detective, if you've ever watched no. that. True Detective. Quality. Cool. But um, I actually think it has some like demonic connotations. Oh. So we got away from that. And on tour, every bad thing that could happen, happened. Like I was, I had just broken up with this girl and was like super lonely and was like drinking a ton while we were on the road. Just like. It was disgusting, man. We lost a rotisserie chicken under the back seat for a week. And <laughs> <laughs> that sentence is a sentence that very few humans have said. We lost a rotisserie chicken under it the gets back worse. seat for a week. All we right. ate cold <laughs> Chef Boyardee ravioli out of the can. And sometimes we would put tuna in it. Okay. And uh, then we would duct tape said can to the wall to use it as an ashtray. Oh, wow. So there was just a real <laughs> a real stank about the place, you know, plus all the dude steam. You know, we didn't shower. How did you find the rotisserie chicken? How did that happen? <clears throat> when we got home from tour and we were clearing out the van, we, we were like, oh, I thought we threw this away. <laughs> what did it look like? I mean, it still looked like a chicken, or at least the carcass of a chicken. Oh, okay. So it wasn't we like We ate most of it. Yeah, no. It wasn't long enough for that. Though it was, I mean, swelteringly hot. There was oh, no air conditioning. Gross. But... So the van was bad. It was not a good van. Mm. We called it the round hand row van. (laughs) And it broke down all the time. And uh, in some pretty sketch areas, like we were in the backwoods of Eastern Tennessee one time and the van was dead. The mechanic said, this van will not start. You need like 1500 bucks to fix it. We had no money. He said, I promise you, you're not going anywhere until you fix this van. And you need to get out of here tonight because like legitimately hillbillies will come out and rob you. So we're terrified. And the only thing I could think to do at that point was pray. And I was praying like, God, just let the van start. And the van started. Hmm. And this happened like four more times. Wow. And one time, there was the last time the van broke down. Same thing. Mechanics like, you need 1500 bucks or something like that to fix it. it Might have been more than that. And we had nothing. The mechanic closed. At like midnight, the dude came back and said, I'll fix the van for $300 if you have it. So we were able to like scrounge together 300 bucks, you know. Like our parents deposited money in our account and we pulled it out or whatever. And um, at that point I was like, okay, God's more than just an idea. Like there's, there's something there where like I can interact with him and he actually care. He like gives a crap, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, 
so very long story short, we, we moved back, we were planning our next tour and I told the guys, I, I think we should be a Christian band. You know, that's the only thing I could think to do. Like I wanted to keep doing music and I knew bands. And they, they weren't Christian. We were like, oh, they were nominally. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, I mean, it used to be like, I mean, my friends would just get messed up and pontificate about like, Hey man, do you think, <laughs> do you think that like the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil was like weed, you know? <laughs> yeah. And like cool stuff like that. Yeah. That's great. And, um, and they were like, no, we don't, we don't want to do that. Mm. So I quit and I moved to Nashville mm. and um, this will lead into the, the pastor. Thing. No, I'm loving this. Cause I, you know, we know each other, but I don't know this story. So this yeah. is great. Um, so I moved to Nashville and I immediately, I was like, I don't know what to do. So I enrolled in a, a graduate program at middle Tennessee state university uh, for recording technology. And uh, again, that was rough because we'd have like midnight. So I lived in Nashville proper. It took me like 40 minutes to get to school. I, I worked 35, 40 minutes the opposite direction. So there was this triangle of just driving. I'd have midnight recording sessions that have to be at work at like 4 a.m. So I was just sleeping in my car a decent amount. And uh, I remember like a couple days, a couple weeks into to classes, this dude was just walking towards me on campus. And I kid you not, he was smoking a blunt and he had a shirt that just said F God. Oh. And I was like, I'm not going to make it. I was kind of like a new devout Christian at that point. I said, I'm not going to make it if I stay here. Like I'll fall yeah. right back into, into crap. So I dropped out pretty quickly and I was like, well, I don't know what to do. Mm. I'm into this whole spirituality thing. Maybe I should go to school for that. So I enrolled in seminary mm. and um, yeah, so I, I did seminary at Lipscomb University. And oh, what were your parents' reaction to this? My mom was like, whatever, you know, she, she was supportive of it. I mean, she didn't tell me not to do it, but I think she was confused. Like, why are you doing, this was your dream. Like you wanted to be a musician. You wanted to work <clears throat> in recording studios. You're giving up on your dream. Mm. I'm like, no, it's not that. It's just, I, I've changed. Like my whole, everything, my thought process is different now. And at that time I had also met who was on my wife, Becca. Who I've heard say so she says hi. Cool. And um my you know, people thought that that was part of it, you know, like, oh, you're changing for you're changing for a woman. And I'm like, no, a woman is like help me change for the better. I remember like distinctly telling Becca when we were on the road, we were texting, we were friends at that point. And I said, I don't know. She, you know, she's always been a devout Christian. And uh she was asking me like about faith, she, you know, getting a feeler for like where am I in that? And I remember saying, I don't know anything about God, but I know that I love his love. You know, and there's a lot of times that I wish I could go back to just that was enough for me. You know? mm. But so anyway, yeah, I, uh, the dudes in my band were kind of disappointed, I think, because they thought like, oh, he's going to learn how to do all this recording stuff. Do you have that clip of you screaming uh, you, your band playing? Is you that on find, YouTube? Yeah, it's on YouTube. We are going to find that and we are going to put a Can we do that? Sure. Put a link below. You had long hair and you were in a metal band and screaming. Yeah. Metal band, punk band. It's metal. Metal <laughs> so, core, I guess. <clears throat> We'll, we'll definitely put a link to that for people's enjoyment. You're going to love it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's real uplifting stuff, you know, <laughs> where this dude's screaming and spitting into the air. But yeah. Um, so, yeah, enrolled in seminary and um, it was kind of ironic. I was in a school affiliated with the Church of Christ, mm -hmm. which believes that if you are not water baptized, you are most certainly not saved. Hmm. Uh, again, just that whole paradigm of you're either saved or you're not, you mm -hmm. know. I was in the seminary and I was not baptized, but somehow they still accepted me into seminary, you know, and that checks out. Um, so we were studying the prison epistles, like Paul's letters from prison and uh, somehow referenced the Philippian jailer in Acts. And I was really moved by that. So I got baptized mm. on campus in the fountain in the middle of the campus. And uh, yeah, my wife and I got married and uh, moved home. And I finished my last semester of seminary online and we found a church and this is kind of funny too. The church we landed in, I remember like the first time we went, we we're like, yeah, music's not good. Didn't care for the preaching. This book that they're reading is really bad. What book was it? It was called The God I Never Knew hmm. by um, Robert Morris. Okay. Um, people might be upset that I said that, but didn't care for it. And um, we're like, but the people are just beautiful. Hmm. This wonderful community. And it's really close to home and they had a lot going on. So we plugged in and we dived in hard and like a year later I was on staff as the youth pastor. Hmm. So. Because you had had your degree in, what, did, what kind of degree did you get from seminary? I have a, a master's in <clears throat> theological studies. Okay. So and I what does it look like when you, do you become ordained or are they just like, yep, we'd like you to be the pastor or the youth pastor? 
Um, and that particular church was a non non denominational church. Yeah. You know, so it was kind of like, um, yeah, we'll just print you out this word document that just says that you're ordained. And that was kind of it. Like there was no <clears throat> formal process, no laying on of hands, you know, yeah. anything like that, which the whole thing felt kind of weird. It was just like, okay, I graduated. I was already doing the job. And then all of a sudden it was like, yeah, here, you're ordained now. So if anybody asks if you are, you can at least show them this. Hmm. Um, so, yeah. There's no ceremony or no sort of thing no. like that. Yeah. No, I guess the elder board has to like approve it. Cool. And what was it like being a youth pastor at that church? I loved it. It was to date the most fulfilling thing I've ever done vocationally, for mm. sure. Just like those relationships. Like teenagers, man, are really fascinating. Like the inherent spirituality they have, even if they claim to have no spirituality at all. Like there's just this, I don't know, it's just this intuitive openness. And that could be formed either very beautifully for the kingdom or very poorly for the world. Mm, yeah. um, so, I mean, I didn't take it lightly. You know, there was... It was a really important role to be in for sure. And if a teenager came up to you during this point and said, hey, what's your opinion of Catholics and Eastern Orthodox Christians? What would you say? Well, I didn't even know Orthodoxy existed <laughs> at that point. But I did have uh, a decent, I don't know if I would call it decent, but I, I did have a lot of exposure to Catholic thought at that point. Um, I was always very amicable towards those things. So mm -hmm. I would tell them like, yeah, they're Christians. They're beautiful. They have all the, I got in a lot of trouble <laughs> Because I kind of like would appropriate some of that spirituality in our youth ministry, which just does not fit. Like what? Like uh, we would do Lectio Divina and we yeah. would do like. Well, you knew of that. You knew yeah. Lectio Divina. So what? when I was in seminary, I took this class called Spiritual Formation and Guidance. And uh, I didn't know like what it was. I just knew I had to take it. So I took it. And I mean, we did a lot of stuff of like silent prayer uh the jesus prayer you did the jesus prayer with your kids or just at seminary you learned at it? seminary I, okay. I learned about it and um the whole world of like i mean i guess it would be jesuit spirituality you know ignatian yeah. prayer exercises the examine the cool. um like praying with scripture imaginative prayer yeah those sort of things blew me away i mean i that was probably the first i guess you would call them charismatic experiences that i had ever had so we had to do retreats. I would go away for like 48 hours, silent retreat. Like, and just, I mean, it just felt like my soul was drinking fresh water. Mm. I mean, these things blew me away. Um, we would do, now I think this practice is kind of weird, but we would do this thing where you like write a letter to God, then you go off and pray for a while, and then you kind of let God respond to the letter, and then you kind of write. His what response? You, yeah. yeah. And I don't know, these things just sort of like wrecked me. So I would like, I would do those things with my, my youth kids. We did like prayer labyrinths, which I think is actually oh, kind yeah. of like, I don't know where that falls. Is that yeah. okay? Whatever. But, um, yeah, it can be, I made one out of duct tape on the floor in our youth nice. room and we would do that. And, um, just a lot of these silent, um, and, and people didn't like that. Cause I would think Lexio Divina would be something that Protestants would be very open to. No. Oh. Well, not this particular flavor, really. Mm. But the kid, the students loved it. The teenagers loved it. They were just like, I've never, my world is so inundated with noise. And people are always trying to get me to like do things. It's nice to not have to do anything. You know, they, they said sometimes you come to youth group and you feel like, oh, it's just an extension of school. It's like school for Christians where we have like a lesson and then we have to talk about it or, you know, whatever. And we did that sort of stuff. But you know, we would do annual retreats where it's like, okay, you're going to sit in silence for an hour. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you think that would be hard to do, but it was hard to get them to talk after that. Interesting. Because they were just so like, I don't know, mellowed out in a good way, you know, open, open to read the scriptures, open to hear. One time this, I could see now how maybe this wasn't, I shouldn't have done. I, I'm glad I did it, whatever. So we did this retreat and I basically set up like a Protestant version of Eucharistic adoration. Mm -hmm. I, bought oh, an, wow. I bought an icon of the Last Supper. I had my friend build these beautiful candle stands out of wood. And I had this kids get up at 530 in the morning and come in and light a candle. That's and beautiful. I had a big, like a loaf of sourdough and a, a, <laughs> a cup of grape juice mm. and have them just sit for an hour and just reflect on the Last Supper and, and what, what communion really means. And did you know what adoration was back then? Yeah, I knew what it was. Yeah. Um, but I, I knew this wasn't really it because we sure. didn't, didn't believe in a real presence. But um, but they loved it. Wow. Uh, so I did a lot of stuff like that. And then I slowly started liturgizing our youth services where we would like, 
the students would kind of process in with a gospel book or an epistle book. They would do a reading. Mm. We would pray the Lord's Prayer together. We would have like uh, responsive psalms. And um, the leadership didn't really love that. And what what was their reason for not loving it? Some of it was, oh, the Lord's Prayer is vain repetition. And I'm like, that doesn't seem right. That doesn't, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's how number one, one of the things that we always talk about all the time is God's word doesn't return void. Like this is God's word, li- like literally in the Holy Scriptures. And Jesus says, when you pray, pray like this. And it unifies us and it's one voice. And uh, I thought it was beautiful, but. Um, Did they ever say it's a bit too Catholic? Though, no, that never happened. After I did, in our college age ministry, I did a study of the Nicene Creed. And um, then I kind of got a talking to of like, hey, maybe don't talk about sacramental Mm -hmm. things. Like, you know, because the church was very keen on like baptism is just an outward expression of an inward decision. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, you can be baptized as many times as you want. And um, at one point I remember communion, we were live streaming and and like there was a, a... uh, a slide that came up that said, like, don't have crackers and juice. Use whatever you have at home, cookies and milk. And, and oh, I was like, wow. I just don't know. But eh, yeah, I don't yeah, know. yeah. You know? So, um, but what's funny is, like, that's the logic. Like, that's if you deny the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist and say that there's no sort of inherent connection or relation between the bread and the body. And that's kind of where it gets you, where it yeah. takes you. It makes sense. It, it like, doesn't really matter. We just do it because. <clears throat> It's an ordinance. Jesus Jesus told us to do it, so we just do it. Yeah. You know, which obedience is beautiful, right? Like yeah. I mean, let's let's try to look at the good things that come out of that. But yeah. So um So when did you get to the point where you left? Because because I mean the first <coughs> conversation we ever had, I was like right before I moved to Steubenville. Yeah. So it was just over a year ago. I was in a um I was buying a used car. That's when you called that. me. Um but I and I knew that you had recently left your job as a youth pastor, yeah. but I don't know really how that happened. Yeah. So <clears throat> like a few steps back, the thing that sort of, sort of got me like rolling on investigating anything else, really, I was content to stay where I was, but kind of appropriate these traditions. And I thought there was something beautiful and uh, unifying about them. Um, I thought they bore a lot of fruit. I saw it not only in my own life, but I saw it in in my students in in youth ministry. But I never thought like, hey, what would happen if I jumped into this thing whole ham dog, as it were? (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I'm trying to think of how that kind of came to be. So really the first thing, the very first thing was my, my stepdad's father passed and he was a Catholic. And at the funeral mass, they asked me to lead, I don't even know what they were called, petitionary prayers. I, I don't know. What, I don't even remember much about like the actual flow of the service, but, you know, they were sensing the casket. Yeah. And um, my hometown, Burgettstown, Pennsylvania, the sunny beaches thereof, um, very small, very run down town. It's basically the plot from the movie Cars. Have you ever seen that? Yeah. So it's like they put in this highway thinking it's going to build up the town and it just destroys it. Everybody just drives past it. So we all, this town, the, the one Catholic church there, I saw the whole town come together. All these people that I knew, some of them were like just a hot mess. Um, some of them I didn't know had any faith. And I saw every one of them come together and do the exact same thing. And there was something really beautiful about that. And uh, my stepdad said to me at the at the wake afterwards, he's like, we're going to make a Catholic out of you yet. And I thought, well, hey, maybe you will. Mm. I don't know. Like, it, it was just kind of, it was interesting. Mm. Um, kind of filed that away. I didn't think much about it after the fact. And then one day I was driving in my car and I was listening to the radio and I was just kind of scanning through and I landed on uh, WAOB, We Are One Body Radio. And I was listening to this smooth voice mm-hmm. and uh, I was like, man, this guy, this sounds like grace. This sounds like the same, the same faith yeah, at least my my understanding of it. This kind of sounds like the same faith, you know, like this guy's a Christian. And I've always been told like Catholics aren't really Christians. They had some good ideas, but but they didn't believe the right stuff. And uh, I found out it was Father Boniface, who was, you know, you had on the show. And uh, I was I was looking for a spiritual director because I was learning about the the ministry of spiritual direction from that class in seminary, really kind of piecing everything together. 
So I, I found his blog, I found his email, I hunted him down, <laughs> I reached out to him, I said, I need, I want a spiritual director, do you do that sort of thing? And he responded and said, I'm, I don't have any time, but I've never had a Protestant reach out for direction and I'm curious as to where this will go. And that was like four years ago and I still, like I, I'm gonna have spiritual direction with him tomorrow. Mm. And uh, so I've been with Father Boniface as my spiritual director for four plus years at this point. And um, so that was like another domino that sort of fell. And then I think the thing that really, so I started paying more attention in our services, like, cause I played guitar almost every week and uh, we were playing this song and I, I sat down with the lyric sheet and I counted that it said it referenced either I or me or us or we 30 sometimes. And it only mentioned God by any name, maybe 10 or 12 times. And I said, I, I can't, I can't be right. Like there's, that's off balance. Like I, and then I looked around the sanctuary and I'm like, these seats are so comfortable and these big screen TVs and people have their coffee in here. And again, I, I don't want to like downplay what was going on in that. Like that church was feeding the hungry. That church was doing outreach. They were preaching the gospel mm -hmm. to the, you know, the best of their understanding of what the gospel is. <clears throat> um, really beautiful ministry things. But I thought like all of this is centered around us and our comfort and our sensibilities. So I just didn't know if that was the right way to do things. Like it didn't look like what I was reading in the scriptures necessarily. And um, then the fire marshal was in one day to like make sure we were up to code, you know, mm. check all of our fire extinguishers and stuff. And this one dude was looking around and I said, what's you okay? And he said, man, this place is a technological wet dream. Wow. And um, I thought, why were you okay with saying that in a church? And did he, but was he a Christian? I, I don't know. But my thought was like, if we were in traditional architecture and there mm -hmm. were stained glass in an altar and yeah, would he have said that same thing? You know? So I brought that up in an elder meeting and uh, one of the elders said, people don't know what holiness is. And I said, I think people know it when they encounter it. And I'm wondering, did he encounter it? Like, what are we doing? How are we preaching the gospel without words? You know, we're all about words. Um, we, you know, everything is, is, is words. Like we don't have any, there's no, you know, iconography of any sort. I didn't know what iconography was at that time, but <clears throat> what are we doing to set people up to experience God from the moment they walk through the door? Right. You know, how is this any different than when they walk into Walmart or Target and there's a greeter and we want to get their information and give them a gift and get them a cup of coffee and make them like, I see how those things work mm -hmm. for bringing people in, but, but where, you know, you get what I'm saying. Like I'm trying to piece that together. Yeah. And then, uh, as a, a charismatic church, we have this strong affinity for the nation of Israel, kind of this bleed in of dispensational theology where mm -hmm. it's like, this is still God's special chosen people. I heard a lot of words about replacement theology. I didn't know what any of that meant, but, so we brought in a Messianic Jewish rabbi to teach about the festival of booths and how that's fulfilled in Christ. And uh, I was like, this is interesting. I'm going to check this out. So he, you know, he preached his message. I don't really remember anything about it. We had the tabernacles set up. We built them in the, in the sanctuary. And at the end, he was chanting and praying and blessing the people, the blessing from numbers, you know, may the mm. Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you. He was chanting it in Hebrew. And afterwards, that, I mean, people were just enamored with this. I mean, they were just lauding the tradition. And I wish we had, I wish, I just love the Jews. I wish we had what they have. <laughs> and at this point, I'm like thinking, we, we've got to have something, right? Like we're, we're making this up every week. It's, it's up to like the production team to decide what songs are we playing? What's the message about? Will there be communion? Won't there be communion? Is there, is there going to be a special object lesson, you know, kind of making things up as we go? And um, I said, there's got to be something. So I was part of this group of guys that would get together to pray at like 6 a.m. And uh, so we got together and we were talking about that service. And um, the one dude, Mike, he said, hey, what do you, what do you know about Greek orthodoxy? I said, I don't know anything about it. I'm not Greek, you know. He said, well, there's this other dad on my son's soccer team. He's Greek Orthodox. He goes to this Mount Athos like every year and he's just like patient and peaceful. He never gets angry and he's never trying to convince me of anything. 
He said, and it's weird because like, even if I visit another Protestant church, they're like still like proselytizing me. And this guy who thinks he has the truth isn't trying to convince me of it. I said, well, let's find out about it. Let's learn about it. So we got a copy of a book called Becoming Orthodox, mm. my father, Peter Gilquist. That blew my mind. We took a visit to an Orthodox monastery in Elwood City. That wrecked me. So then I started like investigating that. And so to tie it back into how I left my position, because I think I just went on a big tangent, um, more or less, I started having meetings with the senior pastor. And I started pushing back on things in our elder meetings, thinking like, maybe we could fix this, you know, and that was the wrong way to do it, I think, too. Like, it wasn't up to me to try to change this whole church's mind on things. But eventually we got to a point where I said, I think I believe that baptism is sacramental and it's a means of grace and it's important and it's not to be repeated. And I believe in the real presence in the Eucharist. And he said, well, you know, you, you might want to consider resigning, you know, because long term, if that's what you believe, you wouldn't be the guy we'd want in this role. And we were building this massive youth center and that was going to be a big thing. And he's like, we really need the right person to lead that project. I said, I don't think I'm, I don't think I am him. So I resigned. How was that for Becca and your family and providing? Um, it sucked, you know? Yeah. But she was super supportive. Like never once was she like, are you sure? Maybe mm -hmm. we shouldn't do this. Cause on her own, like she wasn't interested in these same things that I was interested in, but she was on board with the idea that I, I don't agree wholeheartedly with what we're doing here. I love the people. I love the church. I love everything they've done for us, but I, I just don't think that this is the way to do church necessarily. So she had kind of actually quit going probably almost a year before that, which was weird, you know? Um, but it was, it was hard because we were expecting our second child. We lived in a parsonage. We lived in a church house, you know, um, this was our main source of income. And that conversation about my resignation was the week before all the COVID lockdowns. Oh, wow. So it was like, we have to buy a house during all of this. We have to have a baby during all of this. We have to find, I have to find a job, which I still haven't. Um, so if anybody wants to hire me, that'd be cool. <laughs> <laughs> Throw that out there. But um, yeah, um, the church was cool though. I mean, they, they gave us this buffer zone. They said, we'll pay you for like six months, okay. but like, don't come to work. It's kind of nice. It was, it was pretty nice. <laughs> um, but it was still really hard, man. Like that transition out of that. That takes, I mean, I'm sure you'll object to this, yeah. but, but that takes a ton of courage. Because whenever somebody takes a hit financially, and as you say, it's not like you had something else lined up. It's been over a year now and you still aren't employed. Right. So it wasn't like, well, I know where I'm going and it's a safe bet. You got to a point where you couldn't keep justifying it. And uh, you're kind of suffering the consequences as it were because of that decision. So I think that takes courage. When did we talk? Like it was right. It was after I resigned. So you moved here, what, January? I moved here in January. Yep. January 4th. So it was around that week. I think that we, I spoke. just sent, I sent you an email because at that point how, I was, how did you hear about me? Or? Yeah. So I was searching, uh, Oh, okay. This is, this gets interesting. So I was kind of like Nicodemus style going to Orthodox churches if I was off on a Sunday or I'd go for Vespers or I'd go for a feast day or something. <clears throat> and, um, there was like a month, two months, I couldn't make it to a, to a liturgy or anything like that. And I was used to like, I'll go to a liturgy. So you were going to a Orthodox church while I was still employed. Oh, I see. Yeah. So, uh, but I was just getting dry. Cause I was, you know, that was really feeding me. Was, yeah. And I just couldn't make it, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, I was used to this sort of like spiritual tourism. You know, I remember in seminary, I, I went and visited a Hindu temple mm -hmm. and a mosque and like really investigating everything. And I've always been curious as to like, how do I know that I have the truth? You know, mm -hmm. if I don't, I have to know what everybody else believes in order to really evaluate is, do I believe the right thing? Maybe that's not the right way to live your life. It certainly has made me crazy, but that's where you're at. That's where you're at. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I had just Googled, it was bizarre because I, I, it was right before the great fast that year. And I had Googled Eastern churches near me. Hmm. And I don't know why I didn't type Orthodox and, uh, Holy Trinity, Ukrainian Greco Catholic church came up and I said, it's Catholic, but it doesn't look Catholic. 
it looks orthodox, except there's like no icons and the iconostasis is different. It's weird. And I said, well, maybe you'll check it out. They had a Tuesday divine liturgy at noon, which I thought was weird. So I emailed the church email and Father Jason emailed me back and he said, hey, I hope this isn't too forward, but you want to come over for a steak and a cigar right now? Oh my goodness. Yeah. The first time I ever reached out to him. And um I said, I, I would love and, to. And but just so people know, we've had Father Jason on the show. So right. we've already referenced Father Boniface, who's been on the show. We've had Father Jason, Sharon, yeah. who's been on the show. People need to go check it, check him out. I, I, we both love him dearly. Yeah. He's such a good man. So um, <clears throat> I was like, I'll come to this Tuesday liturgy if that's a real thing. Like, who does liturgy on Tuesday at noon? He said, no, we do. You know. So I, I, I went, I drove to it. Actually, the first time I went to go to it, I chickened out. I thought, no, nah, I, I can't do this. Like, I'm, I'm firmly planted in orthodoxy and... And my priest... Had um, you become a catechumen at that point, or were you just no, visiting? I was still inquiring at that point. And I was really kind of bouncing between... So I was at um, an OCA parish in McKees Rock, St. Nicholas. For those at home, OCA. Orthodox Church in America, Russian Roots, um, which is a very active, beautiful parish. Um, and I, I went... I, I landed there because they had a symposium about Orthodox Christianity and the Scriptures. And um, I wanted to learn about it. I was like, okay, I'm a Protestant. I'm a, I'm a Bible guy, you know, so let's see what, what they believe about the scriptures. And developed a relationship with Father Tom at that parish, and um, have, that's where I am currently. So I went to visit, you know, back to the other thing. I went to visit Holy Trinity, and um, I went to the liturgy, and this this girl, Emily, who's so sweet, I, you've probably yeah. met her. Mm -hmm. And uh, she comes up, she goes, hey, I've never seen you before. Do you want to sing in the choir? <laughs> and I said, I don't. I can scream really well. Yeah. Uh, I said, I don't really sing. She goes, we don't either. Come on. And I was like, this is my first time here. She goes, just come on. You know? So I sang the liturgy in the choir with them. And uh, this other dude, Matt, gave me a, a free dozen pierogies. And I was like, I oh, mean, they're doing everything to bring you in. Cigar, right? <laughs> steak, pierogies. And, um, and then Father Jason sat with me afterwards. And I said, what's, how, how are you this? Like, how are you all of this, but you're still Catholic. Like, what do you do with this Pope thing? What are you doing with the filioque way, the Immaculate Conception? And that just started like these conversations that we had. I mean, that we're, we still have on occasion, but, um, and this was also really, really cool of him. Uh, I told him, I said, Hey, I just basically lost my job. You know, we're moving. He goes, do you need a house? <laughs> I, said, I was like, what do you mean? Do I need a house? Because I have this other parish in Wheeling. Like if you don't, if you have to get out of that parsonage, you can just live there. Oh my goodness. I didn't realize that. Yeah. That was the first time I ever met him. Crazy. So I left and somehow I made this connection between Matthew 25, you know, the, um, I think it's Matthew 25, the gospel reading for the Sunday of the last judgment. Mm -hmm. You know, he says, I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was in prison and you visited me. And I thought, like, man, they housed me, they fed me pierogies, they 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 clothed me in community, they let me sing with them, and um, so I was really moved by that. Um, at this point, like, I'm still not interested theologically in Catholicism, yeah. But you know, there's there's some there's something there, right? And that kind of kicked off this whole over the past. That was years ago. This vacillating, yeah, between the two. So. So when, so I don't mean to make this about me, but I'm interested as to how you and I got in touch. Oh, that's right. Um, so after that, I'm like, okay, so there's a thing called Eastern Catholicism. <clears throat> I'm not interested. I don't think that I could be a Roman Catholic. Mm -hmm. um, I have, I don't, my, my mind isn't working that way. Like I'm not formulating theological ideas that way. And that spirituality, like I like parts of it, but like, you know, I'm not gonna, I, I it's not me, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so I'm, I start researching Eastern Catholicism to try to understand how orthodox is it? How capital O orthodox is it? Yeah. And I come across your video with Father Michael O'Loughlin okay. talking about Byzantine Catholicism and, you know, how that works, which subsequently I ended up getting connected to him, had mm -hmm. like a three hour phone conversation with him. And I, I mean, I've talked to like everybody at this point. <laughs> um, yeah. So if somebody's out there being like, oh, no, you just need to speak to. Done it. Done it. Talk to Already everybody. To him. You know, sometimes it makes it better. Sometimes it makes it worse. <laughs> Um, so that's, you know, I come across your stuff. I start watching like all of your videos. That was a period of time where you were doing a lot of, you know, should we be Eastern Orthodox with Trent Horn and mm. like that kind of stuff. So just really interested. Same thing, like the same feeling I have with Father Boniface, where it was like, you, you kind of spoke the same language as I did. And, um, I knew you were attending a Byzantine parish 
And when you were getting ready to move, you said this thing that I was like, dude, that's me. Like that's you. I'm sure a lot of people felt this way, but you said, you know, I'm excitable and I'm restless. And if somebody were like, let's move to Colorado, I'd be like, yeah, maybe we should. Mm. And I'm like, dude, that's me. So I thought this guy probably thinks the same way that I do. He's got to have some draw to Eastern spirituality, but he's firmly a Catholic. If I'm really going to investigate this, maybe I should like find out how to get a hold of him. So I, I found your assistance email, then connected me to you. I sent you this like desperate email and I, I did the thing that I do that 100% of the time works. Okay. If I want somebody to respond to me, I include a gif of Michael Scott saying, <laughs> you miss 100% of the shots you don't take, Wayne Gretzky, Michael Scott. And they always respond. <laughs> always. Yeah. So um, then you you did and we kind of okay. you know, yeah. connected. Well, so like what you've said up until now just makes it sound like that you're on the path to orthodoxy. I mean, you're an orthodox catechumen right now. Mm -hmm. So why not just do that? Um, I don't know. Yeah. I don't. I just keep having this attraction to Catholicism. Um, but what's strange is you also say that you're not attracted to Roman Catholicism, yeah. which is like 90 plus percent of right. the Catholic Church. Which is weird to me that like people are discerning when they're discerning which path to go, if they leave Protestantism or they're coming from atheism or whatever, that they're like, oh, I'm either going to be a Roman Catholic or I'm going to be Eastern Orthodox. Yeah. And it's like these two are so seemingly they're maybe not that different, um, but they're like really different. I mean, the way that they do theology is different. Okay. And I, I can't understand how somebody's like, these are both live options. Like, how could your brain work in both of those ways? So, um, for me, it's always been either Eastern Orthodox or Eastern Catholic. Yeah. Um, and for those who are watching, who may not know this, talk a little bit about Western Orthodoxy. Yeah. What is that thing? Um, depends on who you ask. There's, <laughs> there's varying opinions on it, but there is in the Antiochian church and in the Rokor Russian Orthodox church outside of Russia, they have what's called the Western Rite, And what it is, is they've kind of tried to revive something from like the sixth century. I think it's, um, father Patrick, who I often have on for debates yeah. is a Western Orthodox, which I'm surprised you haven't gotten more crap for that. Really? I, I really thought like Orthodox people wouldn't be cool with that. Um, I mean the fact that he's debating the position they hold probably gives him a pass. He's not yeah. on talking about the merits of Western Orthodoxy. Right. Is that how you say a Western Orthodoxy? I'm probably Western right. Western right. Yeah. Okay. Within Orthodoxy. So it's like the mat. I think it's the the liturgy of Saint Gregory, <clears throat> right? I'm pretty it, sure it looks like a Latin mass. Yeah, yeah, just in English. Yeah, <clears throat> but um, a lot of Orthodox will look at that and say, "Well, the Western Rite's kind of inherently divisive," um, because well, there's. I mean, this is so laden with with uh, trip wires. <laughs> yeah, I got to really be careful of this. But more or less, it's like. One of the big hallmarks of Orthodox thought is you have this organic continuation of the tradition that's unbroken. And that particular part of it kind of stopped in the 6th century or later, you know, especially by the schism, you know, and uh, has lived, according to Orthodox thought, apart from mm. this continuation of Orthodox tradition. So you're trying to take it and skip this middle part and plug it right back in to a current place when it hasn't had a chance to organically develop now someone might be saying you just admitted to development of doctrine um in a way because there and, and maybe maybe not but so that's part of it and um so if you read like father alexander schmemann he'll talk about he has writings on the western right where he says uh you know the, the byzantine right is is the fullest expression of orthodox spirituality now the byzantine right in, in orthodoxy right yeah which they all i mean other than the oriental churches all use the byzantine right mm -hmm. so like the russian church the antiochian church the greek church the serbian church it is the byzantine right it's mm -hmm. it all comes from constantinople um so there's kind of like the this idea that like this whole other this whole other part of our spiritual life was kind of lost and um that's unfortunate but we can't just like plug it back in and try mm. to make it happen again. Fair enough. Um, I just think it is funny, like people watching at home they who, who are Catholic, they're okay, yeah, I get it. Eastern Catholics, just as Catholic as we are. Um, they are Orthodox who came back into union with Rome back as a 
<laughs> but uh, in the 16th century or something. But they don't often realize that there's orthodoxy, but then you could go to something that looks that there's a Western right of orthodoxy, right. yeah. And there's even an argument that the Western right has been, the Western right in orthodoxy has been Byzantinized far worse than the Eastern churches were Latinized. Yeah. You know, so you'll oh, okay. have icons and not statues yeah. and you know the the language used is very eastern still mm -hmm. um so i get that but. Mm. yeah so why not i mean i don't want to press this if you don't want to go there but why not just become orthodox i mean it sounds like this is where you feel like you're being led it feels like this is where you're being home yeah i guess I, I'm, what i'm trying to ask you is like there must be something about catholicism that just is like a a pebble in your shoe that you would love to be able to i don't want to put words in your mouth but like dislodge it just sounds like an easier life if you'd be like, cool, I'm orthodox. This is it. Done. <laughs> it would be easier. I'm trying to figure out how to say this. We could talk about that. What would be easier? I actually think going Catholic would be far easier for me okay. in terms of like my social life, potential employment, opportunities for my children, education, mm. um, unity, the availability of sacraments, the availability of liturgical services that I could go to, you know, there's Catholic churches on every corner where I could be a communicant. I could go to confession at any one of them. I could go to adoration at any of them. Would I do that? I don't know. I'm, uh, you know, I, I don't live close. Like Holy Trinity is like 30 minutes from me. Yeah. And, uh, the closest Byzantine church is not very active, mm. but so in some senses it would, it would just be conveniently easier to be a Catholic, um, for sure. But, it would be easier intellectually to just to continue on this path towards orthodoxy. And I, I've even tried to <clears throat> claim it as uh, what I've called an ecclesiological Pascal's wager, mm. which is that Catholicism recognizes the validity of the liturgy, the validity of the, or, the, the holy orders, the priesthood, the validity of the sacraments. Within the East, within, within orthodoxy. The, within yeah. orthodoxy, but orthodoxy doesn't always <clears throat> reciprocate that. Mm -hmm. So it's like if I wasn't sure which one was wholly true this would be the route to go this is like the safest bet catholicism orthodoxy orthodoxy yeah because it's like both sides say oh, yeah I this see. is okay oh gotcha you know what yeah, i mean yeah yeah um but the parts about catholicism that have been attractive to me have been like this maybe i've been like spiritualizing this discernment process so um i gotta figure out how to how to pivot this if it were just doctrine which some people would say it should only be doctrine. If it were just doctrine, I'm orthodox all day. Mm. Um, I've had to like really try hard and do a lot of intellectual gymnastics to try to sign off on some Catholic stuff. Like, um, and this is probably the part where the chat blows up and tells me I'm a heretic. Um, Hopefully they'll have a little more grace and patience, the sort of patience they'd like, you know, given to them if they were at this. Yeah, you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> So, um, <laughs> um, okay. What was I saying? Certain doctrines yeah, that yeah, you yeah. just can't get on board with. Yeah, you know, um, <clears throat> so when, when I look at, so I think the thing that kind of happened is, you know, I'm still searching the scriptures. That's, which is good. You know, that's not just an exclusively Protestant thing, but that's what I'm trained to do is to look for my answers exclusively in the scriptures. <clears throat> so that's my starting point, at least. Yeah. You know, at this point, I've kind of shed sola scriptura and all of that stuff. And, um, you know, I'm open to other things. But I'm seeing Jesus locked in this, this combative relationship with the Pharisees. And the Pharisees are on paper right. I mean, he even says, do what they teach you. Mm. Don't do what they do, though. And... um so I'm looking at it and I'm like, okay, I, I believe that orthodoxy has all the right doctrines. I really do. But then I see some of the behavior online, you know, uh, the orthobro thing. And like, even just in some visits to parishes where it's like, people don't talk to you. They don't care if you're there. Um, the American problem, you know, a lot of people talk about the, the ethnic problem in, mm -hmm. in orthodoxy which I really think is just an American issue. Like, okay. I don't think anybody in Serbia or Russia is saying like, the church is too Russian. It's too Serbian, you know? That's, that's, the, that's the point though, isn't it? 
Isn't that the point? That's the complaint. The complaint arises from being an American and going to, say, a Greek Orthodox church and being like, this is really Greek. Yeah. Are you Greek? He's like, no. Oh, well, that's okay. <laughs> I've gotten that. You know, I've, I've gotten that sort of thing before. What did you say when you were going to get your child baptized or something? Or someone oh, yeah. had their child baptized yeah, and they I was were becoming in, Serbian? Yeah, I was in a Serbian parish and the woman, we were talking and she thought it was cool that we were interested. And she goes, you know, my grandbabies, my daughter won't have them baptized. And I just don't understand why she doesn't want them to be Serbian. And I thought, what do you think they're, what kingdom do you think they're being baptized into? Like into the kingdom of Serbia? That doesn't, I digress. But um, the Pharisees, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I see a lot, I've seen a lot of pride, you know, on both sides and in, in the tradition, the trad movement and mm -hmm. Catholicism and, yep. you know, the hardline Orthodox movement as well. And this is something that both sides need to, to learn about and fix and, and correct. Yeah. But um, I'm like, okay, right doctrine's great. But then I also read, like, again, that Sunday of the Last Judgment, that gospel reading, when, when Jesus talks about what you will be judged by when he returns, there's not a single mention of theological correctness in there. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I think it is that theological correctness should lead you to bear the fruit of these things by which you will be judged. Are you feeding the hungry? Are you clothing the naked? Are you visiting the sick and the imprisoned? Mm -hmm. Are you taking in the homeless? Are you doing these things? And at least as an American witness... The Catholic Church is doing an exceptional job of, of I mean, what's the largest charitable organization in the world? Yeah. Whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I see a lot of those things. I, I see people doing that stuff. So that's super attractive, you know, and I'm thinking, okay, what's better? Should I should I yoke myself to a to a system that is doing the things that I need to do to be prepared for my judgment, to bear the fruit that the kingdom of God demands that we bear or do i need to just be right see okay but <clears throat> one of the objections a lot of people have to catholicism is the hypocrisy or they say well i went to a catholic school and you should see what they believe there yeah and the, the faithful catholic responds by saying okay but don't judge catholicism by those who aren't taking the medicine right yeah. judge them judge catholicism by those who are and so couldn't something similar be said about orthodoxy? And, and of course the answer is yes. But sure. um, you know, someone would say, okay, I understand that you, you go into these orthodox parishes and maybe you're not seeing a lot of either welcoming people there or people who are engaged in charity, but they do exist. Sure. And it's so not, just become right and do the right thing. And that's, <clears throat> the, that's the kind of the follow-up thing is there's nothing inherent to the system in orthodox theology that, that would says, prohibit that right yeah. that says don't, <laughs> don't feed don't feed the hungry you know um, make sure you isolate people by asking if they're serbian right demanding yeah. that they be that yeah um and there's a lot of beautiful examples of of that living like focus north america um or the um uh, fellowship of saint moses the black or the neighborhood resilience project in pittsburgh that are doing these things you know and there's there, there are opportunities but the thing is you in america you have this imbalance <clears> where you know Catholics run the show yeah. and orthodoxy is, you know, orthodoxy came to this country as a refugee movement, not as a missionary movement, aside from Alaska. Mm. And if you look at all the other countries where orthodoxy went as a missionary movement, it is the normative form of Christianity. That's not the case in America. So all these refugees pile in, they start bringing in clergy from back home. And now you have these parallel jurisdictions, which is an anomaly. It's a canonical anomaly. Like it, it directly goes against the canons that say you should only have one bishop per city. Mm. Um, which is why, if I understand correctly, even if like, let's say like France, which is predominantly a, a Catholic country, mm -hmm. if if an Orthodox parish sets up a mission in like Paris, they're not going to install a bishop there because there's already a, a Catholic bishop. If if I understand, I might be wrong, mm -hmm. but they'll be under like the um, under the bishopric of like. Like if, if Russia sends, you know, there's a Russian population, so they set up a, par a parish there. They won't put a Russian bishop there. He'll just be underneath one in Moscow or whatever. Um, I don't know why I told you that. But yeah, um, yeah so that's why America's a mess like that. So it's like we're just kind of finding our voice I see. As, as an Orthodox people yeah. in America. Notice there that I just said I our did notice voice. that. Yeah. And you said we. Like we, I'm just, so deeply yeah. in love with and connected to that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, I think one of the things that, well, I got a, a couple of random thoughts which don't connect, but I think are interesting. It seems like even just in my lifetime, each religious group has had its heyday. Each religious group has had a time where they seemed like the cool kids on the block. 
Like there was a time where, <clears throat> you know, I was, after my conversion, I was 17 years old, I would look at the Assemblies of God and I would see, oh my goodness, it's, it's like a rock concert. And to me at the time, that was a good thing, Yeah, you know, but they seemed young, they seemed hip, they seemed positive, they were, they were welcoming, like legit virtues, you know. And, and I'm sure there was a time where I or others thought, I just, I want to belong to this. Like, right. whatever you think of Hillsong, you know, you, you can't deny the fact that they are a beautiful, shiny, attractive group of human beings. And no doubt there were people who were going to some run-down, aging Catholic parish and their evangelical friend invited them to Hillsong. They're like, no, this is it. This sure. is right. So they've had their heyday. And then it felt like <clears throat> there was a time when the Catholic Church had its heyday. It's like John Paul II was a saint, a boss monster. He was a philosopher of a high caliber. And, um, you know, it felt like both orthodox, whatever criticisms could be leveled at John Paul to uh, whatever uh, orthodox and Protestants looked at that man and thought, this guy's a saint. Like, I, I want to belong to that. You know, they may not have wanted to belong to their particular local Catholic parish, which may have been teaching heresy or may have been sloppy in the liturgy, but they'd look at John Paul II and they're like, I, I want to be part of this worldwide church, right? Mm. Whereas now, honestly, for me, I look at Pope Francis, who I'm not particularly impressed with. I see the corruption in the church financially, sexually. I see some bishops who seem to lack backbone. Uh, and and I'm looking at orthodoxy. I'm like, yeah, I can see why that's completely attractive. Mm -hmm. Like, at least online, the curb appeal is great. It's like, yeah, man, like th this is the ancient church. And, and 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 I understand, and as a Catholic, believe that there has been, you know, you can trace the lineage of the Catholic Church back to Christ and the apostles. But you look at the way some novus ordos are. Uh, uh, celebrated. You're like, oh my gosh, it's that or this glorious Russian Orthodox liturgy. So I get it. Like yeah. I, I'm, I feel like I'm kind of with you in that in that attraction to it. Um, obviously, neither of us and no one should be making a decision based on just what seems cool right now. Right. Um, you know, like what if we had like a saintly pope right now? And some people might say we do, but like what what if we had someone who ever, most people are like, well, this guy. You know, he, he's he's terrific, he's holy, his teachings are orthodox, um, there's no there's no ambiguity. Yeah, maybe Catholicism would look a heck of a lot more attractive. Sure. And yet at the same time, we don't want to be deciding where we go based on how something looks and appears in the moment, you know. Right. My mind went into like a hundred different yeah. fractals on that. Yeah. But um, And you know all that. I I know by the way, I know I'm not saying anything you don't know. It's just Yeah, no. Know, but it's but that's, I mean, that's interesting. Like the first time that we ever talked, I was telling you that the attraction to Catholicism for me were th the fruit that I saw in this. And you said, well, that's great. Well, why don't you just be a Mormon? You're like the Mormons are so nice. They'll take care of you. And you're like, and I said, that's just not, you know, as you always say, that's not a live option mm. because I know that there's, that's not true. Mm. So it's been this kind of like head and heart battle to like bring the two together yeah. and connect it. Like what is, what is true? And I realized, you know, along the way, like as I, I dove very deeply into orthodoxy that, I mean, as deep as you can in a number of years, I mean, it's infinitely deep, but um, I never took the time to kind of examine some of these theological things in Catholicism that I, I didn't believe. Mm. I just didn't believe them, you know, and um, I have found that it's at least to the best of my understanding, which is flawed, that things are far closer than I thought they were in a lot of things. Um, so, you know, Immaculate Conception, the view of the Theotokos as Panagia in Orthodoxy. And, uh, there is an idea of, of primacy in, in the first millennium. It's just, you know, where did, did that overstep? And, um, you know, taking St. Paul seriously, where he says, if you depart from the tradition, then you shouldn't go to the table together. Mm -hmm. And that's why there's a break in at least, uh, ecclesial communion and, um, or even, you know, purgatory and aerial toll houses. Yeah. And they're, they're very different, but you see that there's at least some idea that, you know, death is purgatorial. Uh, so it's just like there's there's something to work with there, you know, if we can talk about it, I guess. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so I slowly, like one by one, felt like, oh, you know, I could probably sign off on some version of the filioque. Right. Like mm -hmm. at least, you know, maybe as expressed by like St. Maximus, the confessor or something. And then I thought, oh, but I wouldn't express it that way. 
you know, or maybe I could sign off on some version of the Immaculate Conception. Uh, I'm okay with, I mean, technically you could hold to it as an Orthodox and not be heretical. It's just the imposition of it. Um, so slowly I'm like, I could sign off on, on these things maybe, but I wouldn't express it that way. So does that put me in the position of an Eastern Catholic where it's like, okay, I can't outwardly, I can't outright deny these things necessarily. Mm. So eventually it kind of boils down to just the issue of the papacy, mm. um, which still, you know, I just, I'm not, I can't, like, I'm not at a point where I could do that. Um, I have a question and forgive my ignorance here. Sure. Okay. But sometimes I think Catholics view Orthodox as, um, this is going to make people angry. I don't mean it to be disrespectful, but as Protestants who also have the fathers and who also have maintained the traditions within the liturgy. Um, I guess, what do you think of that? Um, because it's almost like sola scripture plus the consensus of the fathers, plus we have to maintain the liturgy. But I wonder what happens when you get down to issues of the day that need to be discussed and decided upon. And suppose you're an Orthodox priest who thinks actually contraception is okay. You know, this is not something, you know, that should divide us or, or whatever. I mean, contraception might be an obvious issue, but well, it's an easy one to discuss. Do you then just like leave your Orthodox communion and join another one? Because that's the other thing I think a lot of Catholics wonder about, you know, and, and please don't hear me say, look how united we Catholics are. You only have to spend 10 minutes online to realize we're a mess as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but, but, you know, you, you have Serbians and Russians and Greeks, and then you have this sort of schism between the, the Greeks and the Russians. And it, it, it also looks messy over there as well. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, in terms of the bouncing around, I mean, that definitely happens where people are like, let's say they're in a Greek parish and they're like, oh, there's a lot of, you know, liberalism here. And uh, so I'm going to go to a Russian parish. It's far more conservative. I mean, you see the same thing in Catholicism where mm -hmm. somebody's like, I'm in a Novus Ordo parish and it's getting super liberal. So I'm either going to go to a Latin mass or I'm going to go to a Byzantine church. And But neither, but that person isn't breaking union and doing that. That's yeah, the well, difference. I mean, right? in reality, neither is the Orthodox. Oh, I see. So even though like, so in the example that you, you put forward of like uh, Constantinople and Moscow being out of communion, mm. to the best of my knowledge, I don't think anybody, some people say, well, there's a parallel church now, but it's still one church. So like, okay. you know, first millennium, you see kind of more of this communion ecclesiology, Eucharistic ecclesiology, where it's like at any given point, one of the particular churches is out of communion with another one. Like that's not abnormal at mm -hmm. all um in church history like even i think like saint john chrysostom when he died wasn't in communion with rome if i if i remember correct i might be wrong um but he's still a saint in catholicism yeah, mm -hmm. yeah so it's yeah. like he wasn't technically he wasn't in communion so you would say he wasn't part of the church but he's still a canonized saint hmm. so there's this uh kind of flexibility when it, when, yeah. it, when it comes to that um so in some sense maybe i i do think even Currently, maybe here comes the. Here's a potential position that someone somewhere probably holds. Right. Asking for a friend, <laughs> um, that it is still maybe one church. Right. Uh, it's just currently these ones are not in communion with one another. Mm. I I would like it to be that. That'd be far easier. You mean Catholicism as yeah, well? Yeah. Think, yeah. Who, yeah. Who wouldn't? Right. So, um, you know, a friend says like. The, Satan loves to divide, and if he can't actually divide, he at least gives the appearance of division, mm. you know? And um, there's plenty of examples, especially with the Eastern churches, you know, Eastern Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, where, like, they're, you know, they're they're cross-communing, uh, you know, if, either way. Like, I know Catholicism allows for that sort of thing. Like, an Orthodox could yeah. commune there, but but vice versa, too, has happened. Mm -hmm. Like, like I've heard of those sort of things. But... um especially in the Middle East, like you go to Syria, the Melkite church and the Antiochian Orthodox church, they will can celebrate Pascha together. Mm. Uh, and part of that is because of persecution. So maybe that's what we need. But um, yeah. it's, what it's funny is like in some sense, it seems like Catholics are bending over backwards to say, hey, brothers, like we're, we're the same, like, please, you know. Um, why, whereas it can seem that the Orthodox are very like, we're nothing like you, go away, you stink. But then at the same time, it's like, no, if you break communion with the Pope of Rome, if you, if you, if you deny papal infallibility, like you are in 
schism. Like you're out, you're outside of the bounds. Sure. Yeah. Well, even with the bending over backward thing, like <clears throat> in my opinion, I think that the Catholics need the Orthodox to be like, Hey, we're not going to bend over backwards when it comes to the liturgy or when it comes to doctrine, like Lex surrounding Lex credendi, right? We, we pray what we believe. Like you don't trifle with the liturgy. Mm. And I mean, this is a pain that, that you you're going through right now is like, uh, we're being liturgically suppressed. We're being, mm -hmm. you know, all these innovations and crazy crap. And, mm -hmm. um, so and that's going to be a turn off for you as somebody who's looking at these two things. Is is it a turn off? It is, yeah. yeah. And you know, a big thing that I I heard a priest <clears throat> say once too, like when he was a pres an Orthodox priest, when he was a former Presbyterian, say like, I realized that the the church my children would inherit could not be guaranteed to be the same church. And I thought about that, like my life. I grew up in a a broken home, you know. And my I moved around a lot. I had no stability. So just on a practical level, I want to provide my children with sp uh, uh, stability, not just in the home, but spiritually as well. Like I want to give them a firm, a firm foundation and I want to be able to guarantee that their children and their children's children are going to inherit the same church mm. that believes and expresses the same things and prays the same way, you know, and, yeah. um, can I try to sum up where you're at just so that I can find out where I'm wrong? Sure. You know, so it sounds like right now you've, you've had this sort of journey discovering the, 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 the truths taught by orthodoxy and Catholicism. And you feel that what the Orthodox church maintains and teaches is correct. Um, but a lot of your friends, such as your spiritual father and others are Catholic and you see a, a, a virtue in them that can't be discounted. And the idea that, well, it's true over here, so just go there, is, is, to, is to discount um, the importance of the communal aspect that you see in the Catholic Church, perhaps, and the way in which it feeds the poor and, and puts emphasis on that. And so it feels like, I don't know, like too, too quickly to say, well, whatever, Right. Whatever about that, that's not what matters. What matters is right doctrine, and so it's over here. So just do that. Um, is that does that kind of not not to mention the other <coughs> problems you have with sure. with Catholic doctrines that you cannot go all the way there, like with yeah. papacy filioque, like maybe somewhere. But why would I bother to try when I'm also looking at what's going on at Rome? When I'm seeing what's going on in some of your parishes? Yeah, I think that's that's all in all pretty fair. I mean, okay, because if that's fair, then I think you should become orthodox. Yeah. Bec and uh, people are going to be <laughs> very upset. Everybody's going to be mad at both but of us. But what they don't realize is that you and I have talked for hours about the papacy, filioque, the immaculate conception. And not only that, but like you and I and Scott Hahn have had cigars and spoken about this. And we've gone to dinner and spoken about this. Um, so... Uh, I'm just thinking like someone in your position, it it makes sense that you just become orthodox <laughs> and then be th those things that you see in Catholicism. Okay, so obviously I want you to become Catholic because sure. I think Catholicism is the fullness of the truth. Um, but but why not do that? Like I mean, that's that seems... probably what I'm going to... I mean, that's what I'm doing. All right, right? cool. <laughs> well, thanks for watching, everybody. No. <laughs> <laughs> but the, I mean, it's, it's still... It's something that you have to talk about. Like, you're right. You can't just immediately dismiss these things over here. But on, on in the same vein, like, I can't immediately dismiss all of Protestantism either for the same reasons. Like, so there's something that, like, when you look at, I guess, especially post-Vatican II, this expression of all baptized believers are in one degree or another yeah. in communion with the church, yep, yep, yep. That, that, that's helpful. You know what I mean? That's helpful to say like, oh, good, we're all Christians, you mm -hmm. know, but there's a spectrum of, of belief and understanding in orthodoxy as well, where you will have on one movement, there's no grace anywhere else. If you pray with these people, you're in heresy and you're inherently in schism. Um, you know, I, I have a, a friend who is a, <coughs> a Ruthenian Catholic priest. He was an Anglican. And uh, when he converted... Uh, it was between, he's like, I knew I was Eastern. I knew I had to go one way or the other. He said, I had one brother who's a Ukrainian Orthodox priest. And when we would go on family vacations, he refused to pray with us even at meals. Mm. He said, 
that's just so, you know, I just, he, to him, he's like, that doesn't feel like Christ to me, you know? Um, so, but then who's to say in orthodoxy? That's what I always find difficult. And that's not meant to be a gotcha question. It's just like, if I was, if I was discerning orthodoxy, you've got these real issues about if you're not orthodox, you're going to hell or maybe hell doesn't exist according to some orthodox or, and I just want to know, like, how do you get away from having an ultimate authority that makes these decisions to teach, to continue to teach the church? You, you must see the appeal in that, even if you ultimately disagree with it. Sort of. No, no. Really. I mean, I do. I brought this up in a chat, I think in one of the morning coffee things, like what well, number one, people who don't do well with gray areas don't do well in orthodoxy mm. because it is so yoked to mystery. And even the scriptures are pretty mysterious. You know, the script, scriptures don't have any like real explicit teaching on things like hell. I mean, you can, you can glean something from that and, and formulate uh, that it exists and that it's real. Um, but like what happens when you die, what happens at the moment, the soul separates from the body, like, yeah, sure. you know, things like that. So we need to be okay with that sort of, uh, you know, you can't mm. grasp everything sort of thing, which I find appealing. Yeah. There's frustrations in that, but there's equal frustrations with somebody who can define and parse out everything. So that's, you know, like, for example, there's a lot of like Catholic teaching on uh, finances and economics and stuff like that. That like blows my mind. I'm like, why? I mean, I guess it's somebody said like, isn't it good? You know, the church should have something to say about those things. I'm like, yeah, but at a certain point, you know, now let's tie it back into that idea of like a pharisaical uh, doctrine. So it's like, you know, the fair, eventually it became that there was like 600 some, I mean, more, there was just, you know, the traditions of. I got to be careful with my words. At what point are you, are you binding people to so much teaching authority that you yourself cannot bear to keep them? Mm. And that seems to be a fracturing problem that I see in Catholicism. And is that there's so many points of Catholic explicit parsed out teaching on every little thing that the faithful within can't keep them all anyway. And, and see, I think, um, why Jimmy Aiken is so necessary is that I think he would say that, th that that's not the case, that Catholics often make it seem like there is much more you have to accept. Sure. And that there is actually a lot of play in the joints. So like even though you'll hear a Dominican talk about Thomas's answer to free will and God's sovereignty, okay, but you still have um, you know, Molinism as, a, as an option that a Catholic can embrace even though the Dominican thinks he's wrong. So there is this... Um, there is this uh, flexibility there, and you might just say like there are these kind of guardrails, and within that, you know, um, that's actually why I appreciate Jimmy Aiken so much. I often find that Catholics get super into their particular thing and sure. their way of explaining something. You know, one example would be the Rosary. I, 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 it's so funny because I love the Holy Rosary, but it just bugs me when you hear Catholics say things like, "You have to pray the Rosary, or you're not a Catholic." You're like. But the Catholic Church doesn't teach that, right. except for that. Well, that's even the thing, like with the lady, like how do they know what is, what holds how much weight? Like it's it's so defined yeah. that it's like like academic almost. I would right? have to spend the rest of my life studying how to parse out and define what is authoritative in Catholic teaching before I could even follow it. I see, and that's what I think. Like Jordan Peterson talks about this too, with when it comes to orthodoxy and what's attractive about it is personal responsibility, like. Okay, you're, you're you you say this too. Like you have the scriptures, you have the lives of the saints, you mm -hmm. have the prayers, you have the catechism. I've yeah, said that. I always yeah. include that. Sure, and uh, I mean there are catechisms in orthodoxy, mm -hmm. and um, it's like okay, you know, like he says, pick up your cross and stumble up the hill to the city of God. Like, and that struggle yeah. of you know you you can't know everything. And that's what faith is all about. Mm -hmm. You know, so I guess it, it appears to me, at least on a personal level, that sometimes the 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 tendency to overdefine in in Rome's corner almost eliminates I don't want to say eliminates faith that's a bad way to say it <clears throat> but I I think you kind of get what I'm saying like isn't part of the problem that like Catholicism has had to confront maybe different sorts of heresies than the East has like if you're a persecuted church um, maybe you're just trying to stay alive as opposed to respond to particular heresies. Whereas you're saying that orthodoxy as the persecuted church yeah. being like under the Ottomans and different things yeah. like that, communism. 
Yeah. Whereas, you know, if you've got all sorts of like Protestantism, for example, that's going to make you have to define a lot of things. If people start saying false things, you you have to, in response, say right things. Um, and then you know, even in orthodoxy, if you start to press orthodox about, say, the the energies essence distinction, I mean, you got to get pretty bloody specific if you want to show that it doesn't contradict God's divine simplicity. So, uh, you know, maybe this is just where I I struggle to understand. Um, you know, like I, I see what you say when you talk about the mysticism of the East. I, I, I love that sound. I love the sound of that. Um, and no doubt God is ultimately mystery and unknowable. Um, uh, but, you know, if I'm going to respond to real specific objections, I need to give real specific answers. Yeah. If I'm going to show that I'm not, I'm not contradicting myself. Um. Yeah. So I, I get I get that you probably disagree with that, but like, do you really see where I'm coming from? I do. Yeah. yeah. Like, if if someone wants to, if someone has a very nuanced heresy regarding the two natures of Christ, you, you're going to have to get real specific. I know that this happens now in our current context and culture and on the internet, but this whole idea of among the laity combating over orthodoxy and heterodoxy is pretty foreign to orthodox uh, life like you yes there's a large contingency right now of, of online orthodox people that are like you're a heretic you're this you're this is wrong that's not that's not the way that it's done like that's not you're not gonna it's just not part of the system if that makes sense like um you know I'll just leave that at that. But um, yeah, it's interesting. Like even as you're saying, you know, something about like having somebody to have like an ultimate authority and define things. It's even strange to say like, okay, you know, this, this papacy, this Pope figure, this Bishop of Rome, who's supposed to be the source of unity mm. seems <clears throat> like he's anything but right yep. now. Yep. And then even as you have all this infighting for geopolitical reasons, over here in the in the Eastern Church and Orthodoxy, I actually know that the faith that I'm going to hear and pray in any of those churches is going to be the same. Mm. Um, so I mean, you want to talk about unity, like even like let's say if Bartholomew, uh, this is going to get hot, but let's say Bartholomew uh, had some friends in who brought and a, just for those at home, Patriarch of Constantinople, yeah, Patriarch yeah. uh, for the Greek Church and others. Let's say he had some friends in from out of town and and they brought a statue and everybody kind of bowed down to it in the garden. You better believe the, the the laity of that church would change the locks and they would depose him. Like there would be no equivocation whatsoever about that. So there is a deep unity in orthodoxy, even though people want to point at it and say, oh, it's not one church. It's yeah, it has problems, but like... <clears throat> And then, you know, the counter to that is something that people express as part of the beautiful thing of Catholicism, you know? Well, just just to be clear, I mean, a, a faithful Catholic took that idol and threw it in the Tiber sure. yeah, and yeah, it was yeah. celebrated all over the world. Right. Um, but then there's like a subsequent attempt of like, let's maybe make this sound like it wasn't as bad as it was, or mm. then some people made it sound worse than it was or, or whatever. Yeah. Maybe that wasn't a great example. But the point that I'm trying to make is is that I really do look at the two and I see that like... Yes, there's this kind of community in Catholicism that that seems more unified, um, but in terms of faith and belief and consistency, it it seems like Orthodoxy is far more unified in that regard. Um, and in general, like when I now we could get into the topic of like doctrinal development if if we wanted to. I don't know that we should, but it, it seems that Orthodoxy has kind of maintained this semitic mind that the early that the apostles had mm. you know that I, I believe that any of the apostles would be able to teach comfortably in an orthodox church um and i try to like play that out you know what, what would it look like if saint paul showed up at you know your average novus ordo parish and started teaching you know how would people receive that if they didn't know who he was um it does seem to me that in most orthodox parishes people would say yeah this is our faith um so for whatever that's worth, I don't know. 
Um, I mean, this might be a little defensive on my part, but the fact that we read Paul's epistles at every mass, I would think that we would sort of be like, yeah, this yeah, is our well, faith. I, yeah. I, that's fair. That's true. I'm sorry. I didn't know. No, it wasn't an attack. Um, that's definitely not what I But your point yeah. was that maintain the Semitic mind. Yeah. And uh, so the Orthodox would actually look at, at like Roman Catholicism and Protestantism and say these two things are far more similar. Yeah. Um, in some ways. So, I mean, just, you know, ignore the question if it's too much of an ask, but like what specific things do you think um, people would react to in, in Paul's preaching that you think are, are more in line with uh, Orthodox kind of not only the, the, the doctrine, you know, in some library far away, but also lived out in these, you know, Orthodox parishes that you see. What are some of the things that you think are more in line with um, that than it would be, you know, on the Catholicism side? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And I'd have to think probably a lot longer than I have to do that. So sure. maybe that kind of reveals a deficiency in my own thought process, which I'm okay with. Um, I recognize that like, I'm, I'm not super smart. I, I'm educated, yeah. but I'm not super smart. And, uh, and all of this in the scheme of things is still kind of new, but yeah. you know, one, one passage that I referenced before where, where, uh, Paul's saying like, hold fast to these traditions, you know, whether we taught you in, in letter or word of mouth and then in another spot. And I think one of the Corinthians first, maybe, you know, if anybody's departed from these things, like don't go to the chalice with them. Don't, don't go to the table with them. Um, and kind of that, you know, forced idea maybe in Catholicism where it's like, we are going to maintain this unity in this Eucharistic cross communing by any means necessary, you know? And even though there's some varying theological thoughts or expressions and maybe sometimes they are even contradictory to one another I, I don't know like especially in the eastern and western expressions you know um i feel like i just didn't answer you really well what was the question again if you guess... was, so so you were saying that you think that the uh, <clears throat> orthodox church both in its doctrine kind of in a, you know, Orthodox library locked up far, far away, but also in how it's lived out in the Orthodox parishes that you've seen, um, you think that it more closely reflects, you know, the apostles mm. and what they would teach and they would be more comfortable in an Orthodox church. So it's just kind of, I, I, I you know, it seems like there's a lot of talk of, about like, you know, consistency <laughs> and like the doctrines, how they look on paper and then how they look lived out and things like that. I think just my question is, you know, if you don't mind, like, getting into like specifics, like what are some specific things that you think that um, maybe you've seen in parishes, um, either Catholic or Orthodox, where they would be more or less comfortable with what specific things? So even let's stick with the liturgy, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and to be fair, all the things that are apostolic about the Eastern liturgy are part of the patrimony of the West too, you know? And unfortunately that's the, that's the part of your tradition that's, some would say being actively attacked or, or suppressed because like a, um, a, uh, so a friend of mine went to seminary in his church, I think his church history or maybe his new Testament professor, ironically enough, was a, was a practicing Jew. And, um, and she said, you know, if you want to see the closest thing to temple worship that we have, and this is all she knew at the time was go to a, go to a Latin mass, you know, and the, the Latin Mass and the and the Byzantine liturgy, in terms of its form, I mean, I still see that form even when I visit a Novus Ordo parish. Loosely, it's there, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but that it, it's it's the same in that continuity. You know, in Acts, the apostles and the early Christians were still going into the synagogues, were still going to the temple. They were maintaining that worship, and they were doing the the exclusively Christian parts of it in their homes. And then eventually, they kind of you know, brought the two together. So, um, do you think if the West was Latin, just, it was all Latin mass, you'd be a lot more open. I don't know. Cause yeah. I, I, I don't know. I've never been to a Latin mass. Oh, well, let's so, take you. Yeah. I'd check it out. Yeah. I don't know. You know, there'd probably be a part of me too, that would find something to say like, Oh, well, you know, why isn't it in the vernacular? And, you know, and I think about too, like even missionary activity, you know, the way that the, the West did missionary activity versus the way the East did missionary activity. 
where there's a lot of imposition of you have to learn Latin and adopt our customs, mm. where it seems to me that the East did a, a better job of going and, and learning the culture and baptizing the good things and get rid of the bad things. And You don't think that happened in the West so much? It doesn't seem like, I mean, like if you go to India, right? Yeah. So you have like the Malankara church, in yeah. both, both uh, or Malabar. Malabar, yeah. yeah. Um, both Catholic or Orthodox, you know, and they have their distinct flavor in their liturgy, but they, they maintain all those elements. But then you also have like this uh, large portion of, you know, the Indian population celebrating the, the Roman Catholic mass too. Like, mm. why are both of those there? Mm. You know, why did we have to impose something that was distinctly gotcha. Western on them. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, when there was this right to begin with, I'm not sure much about the Malabar, where they yeah. came from. I mean, it kind of happened everywhere a little bit. So yeah. like, even if you go to like Alaska, right? The the Russians came over Yeah. and, and, um, <clears throat> walked if, next door. If, yeah. Sense. Walked over the ice shelf and, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, evangelized them. And they kept things like they took their totem poles and they made them into icons. Yeah. You know? So it's like, well, you believe that you don't believe that your God is actually in this. It's just like, you know, a depiction and it's like a window into, you know, so they kind of reappropriated that. So one of the things I thought was so important to have you on to talk about, is just like that angst, that, that feeling of being unsettled where you want to make a decision, but for the life of you, you can't, you said already that you keep vast or had kept vacillating between the two. And just what an exhausting experience that is where one day you're convinced of one thing, the next day you're convinced of another. I imagine sometimes you even try to impose upon yourself a sort of artificial certainty so you can sure. finally think about something else. Yeah. And I keep thinking like, if I could just get this one thing figured out, maybe everything else will fall into place. Mm. You know, maybe I'll be able to find, you know, vocationally that'll work out, you know, my family, you know, my wife and I are, are not entirely on the same page with it. And, you know, maybe if I had some stability in this and was sure, like she'd be like, okay, maybe I'll give it a shot, you know? Yeah. Um, and she did kind of give it a shot, but then she saw that I was still, well, maybe this, maybe yeah. that, you know? So like, I mean, am I just catching you on a like Orthodox bend at this point? Like if I had interviewed you a week ago or in two weeks from now, might this sound a lot more, I'm open to Catholicism? Dude, I don't know. Yeah. God like, bless you. What a beautiful answer. Yeah, um, I love that. I mean, if you would have asked, what's today, Friday? If you yeah. would have asked me on Monday, I I actually, you know, forgive me for Orthodox friends listening. I was like, maybe, you know, maybe I do belong there, you know? Then there's the whole issue of, and we could talk about this too, like, okay, I I want to discern properly using my my reason to look at all the evidence and come to a conclusion. But I also want to be open, and maybe this is a hangover from my charismatic days of, where does God want me? Mm. You know, could it be possible that he maybe wants me somewhere that I don't understand? Maybe he wants to require that level of faith, or maybe there's something he wants to do in me and through me with me in that space, you know? Um, and some people might say like, that's, that's foolish. Like you just need to go with what's true. Mm. I'm like, well, okay. You know, what is truth? Like if God is truth and prayerfully, I feel like he's revealing for me to go somewhere, then I need to follow that. Um, now I like what you're saying because what you're not saying is if I feel that God's leading me somewhere that contradicts what I know to be true. That's not what you're saying. Right. Right. So I think that's important. That's an important distinction there because you're not being a like religious indifferentist at this point. You right. are saying like, maybe I don't understand everything about it. Um, I don't, you know, I, I would, I won't accept something that I think to be in con contradiction to the truth. I mean, you can even look at something like maybe a loose analogy, like the prophet Jonah, like he's called to Nineveh and he's yeah. like, no, that's not a good place. I don't want to go to there. <laughs> um, but he, you know, and he runs away from it and he runs away from it. And then ultimately he, he follows that call and then like something good happens out of that. Right mm. now, I'm not saying that the Catholic church is Nineveh and I'm going to call it to repentance and mm. fix all of its problems. I know that's not the case. Be cool. If it was, okay. please come. Wouldn't it be? Come. Um, <laughs> But yeah, you know, so it's like I've had these moments in prayer and I, you know, circling way back to like the Ignatian stuff, right? Hmm. I'm having a hard time letting go of that. You know, that's not something that exists in Eastern thought. There's kind of this avoidance of imagination and uh, and that sort of thing. But I, I've discerned a lot of things using that that process. 
I've been told by individuals like, hey, when you come into the Orthodox Church, you have to renounce that. And 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 forgive me, but it also sounds like you've had experiences where our Lord has done profound healing in you through these imaginative experiences <laughs> that you can't discount. Exactly. So, um, you know, I, I was doing, I was in a, a program where I was getting a certification in lay spiritual direction. So like I, um, part of our reading for that was this book called um, God's Voice Within by uh, Father Mark Thibodeau. He's a, a Jesuit. And so I'm reading this book, and this is around the time that I'm kind of like, I've just kind of discovered Holy Trinity, but I'm comfortable at St. Nicholas. And I'm like, where do I go? What do I do? And I thought, well, this is a great resource. Like he's, granted it's Catholic, he's talking about this is how you can kind of discern things. You know, look for the movements of the spirit, consolations, desolations. You're, you know, looking back from your deathbed, which decision do you wish you would have made? Play it forward, pray it forward and think, what will my lo- my life look like if I go down this path, if I go down this path? And when I read that book, every single thing that I went through on that was like, you should go, you should join the Catholic church. Mm. But then I'm like, okay, my, my Orthodox sensibility say you can't trust that you could be, de- you could either be deceiving yourself or even in your prayer, these maybe visions that you're receiving or whatever could be demonic influence, you know? So you got to resist those. Mm-hmm. And if you resist the devil, he will flee from you. But if it's God, like he's not going to stop. Um, so that, that's kind of a weird tension where I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe that's just a natural part of my, my spiritual growth where it's like that, that played a part of my life for a, a particular period yeah, of time. Like and, the writing of the letters. You right. Know, and, which uh, I think now we would look back on and be like, I could see how God would work through it, but it doesn't seem like a, yeah, not a, a good thing to maybe great do way now. to yeah. be like, this is basically scripture. It's exactly. God's words. Yeah. Um, so that's hard because there's like these profound emotions attached to that, to these experiences, you know? And even like one day I I was like, okay, you know what? Screw it, man. I'm just not going to eat for three days and I'm going to pray and I'm going to fast as though this were some prescription for getting an answer after three days, you know, that's, I don't know. It's kind of cool. I love it. I love your enthusiasm and your heart. But that's not how it works, right? So what happened though? When did you faint? Well, I didn't faint, no. but I did it. And I did the same. I was praying and I was like, okay, if, if I go down this path and I look at my life, I'm like, I'm going to have, you know, I'm going to have all these people. I'm going to have all these, you know, I could see maybe this vocational path, you know, in front of me. And I could maybe influence people for the kingdom of God and do all these really great things and be really comfortable and be really happy. Like it was just a very smiley thing that I was discerning. And I thought I, I finished that prayer and I said, all right, that's what I'm going to do. Now the next day, sorry, what was the conclusion? The conclusion was if you I were w- going to if I went down the Catholic path, I would be far happier. Oh, okay. And then the next day, I thought about it. And I said, all those things that I thought were going to make me happy really were kind of worldly things. Mm. Um, so is worldly happiness the the right thing to pursue? You know, is that me just tapping back into some some prosperity gospel or some version of it that yeah. that I was that I was a part of at one point where it was. If I just do all the right things, if I follow what I think God is, uh, he's going to bless me. I'm going to have all this prosperity and all these relationships and and things like that. And again, you know, I, I, I read all these Orthodox writings where it's like, you're going to suffer. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be, you're going to be trampled underfoot by the world. And, uh, and that's how you like, that's good. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, that's how, you know, but so for whatever that's worth. Tell us a time when you were um, basically about to bite the bullet on orthodoxy. Because I think you've spoken a lot as someone who's like um, looked at Catholicism and have shown us like why you just can't get on board with it. But like, can you can you, can you, can you flip for a second and yeah. t- tell us about maybe the times that you've almost bought into orthodoxy, but what was it about Catholicism that kept bringing you back? I mean, you've spoken a little bit about yeah. apostolic activities and Sure. Community. Well, I'm, I'm on my second go around in the catechumenate in the Orthodox Church. Right. Um, so I was a catechumen before by myself without my family. And uh, I got to this point where Becca was, my wife, was so attracted to what she saw in the people in Catholicism, and specifically at that Ukrainian parish, you know, in, yeah. in Carnegie. And, um, and I was, there was another family that was received into the Orthodox Church like a couple weeks before I was supposed to or something. And it broke my heart because I was like, 
that whole family, I can't do this by myself. I can't do this. Because either what's going to happen is I'm going to be received into the church by myself and my family's not going to be there. And it's going to be one of the most profoundly lonely experiences of my life, which should be the most profoundly joyful. Yeah. Or my family's going to be there watching me saying, well, there goes dad without us. And uh, neither of those felt like a good option. Yeah. So Becca was like, listen, if, if this is what you want to do, I will, I won't attend this Orthodox parish, but I will attend Holy Trinity with you weekly. Just attend. I'm not saying mm. I'm going to join. And I said, you know what? I, I want to unify our family as best as I can. So I left the catechumenate, which was painful and hard in and of itself. And we started going to Holy Trinity. Mm. And uh, at first it was fine. I was like, this is an Eastern church. It's familiar. I love the liturgy. I feel like I'm getting the same sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But then like slowly over time, there was this large influx of like Latin Rite Catholics. I guess that would be the, the yeah. right terminology. Yeah. So it started kind of diluting it a bit. And mm. it's like now people are playing, praying the rosary together and just the language at coffee hour is different. Like we're not, it's, it's like we're not speaking the same language that we were at one point. And then m the month of May hit, which there's this extra Buckle emphasis. Up. Yeah. <laughs> extra emphasis on Mary and um, a lot more discussion of what I what I at the time deemed to be specifically Western expressions of Mariology. And both my wife and I got very uncomfortable. And I said, I, you know what I, I said, I, I want to, I want to be an Orthodox Christian, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so we left there and then kind of bounced around, went to the Serbian parish for a while. Um, so I, I was very close to becoming Orthodox. That, that was like a year or two ago. And then I thought I was like 85% sure at least that we were going to be received into this Ukrainian Catholic church hmm. and then kind of bailed out of that. And maybe people are listening and saying like, well, see, this guy can't make up his mind. Like, I know that's the point of the conversation, yeah. but like, um, but not a virtue we're trying to extol. Yeah. I'm not <laughs> trying like, to say like, it's this is the way to do everything. <laughs> it's like, it's a human reality, but it's a painful one. You right. Know? And even those things like family, you know, I know that there's scripture that says like, if, if you don't leave behind father or mother, or I believe it even does say spouse, husband or wife, you know, for the kingdom of God, you know, you're not worthy to enter it or something like that. But I also believe like God led me to this woman and blessed me with these children. And if I do, don't do everything I can as, as the priest of my own home to unify us in faith, mm. even if that means I have to sacrifice my understanding of being correct, you know, what's the more virtuous decision here mm. to, to sacrifice my family for the sake of doctrinal purity or to sacrifice doctrinal purity in my opinion mm. for the sake of, of my family. That's a really hard decision to make. And even, you know, tying the family issue too, like Everybody says, just read the fathers and you'll be Catholic. Just read the fathers and you'll be Orthodox. Just read this book. Everybody has some book that they think is going to solve this problem. And it's like, listen, I could spend the rest of my life reading books and not get through all of them and never make a decision. Yeah. But I do have a life with this woman and these children. Mm. And I have to be attentive to that. Yeah. Um, so I can't dump all of my time into going to every service and reading every book and, uh, yeah, that's great. That's so true. We spoke about this a little bit beforehand about how sometimes it seems like people just want you on their team mm -hmm. because it will justify and reaffirm their own decisions, which they might be insecure in. I see this with Jordan Peterson. You know, it's like it's like people smell blood because he just mentioned he loves Jesus or something. Yeah, and I don't mean to. I'm not calling into question everybody's motives obviously people want him to come to know christ and to have salvation receive eucharist his wife tammy has talked repeatedly about her devotion to the rosary which is beautiful and i think a big thanks should be given to bishop robert Barron for that uh, she, she's i think said explicitly uh, that he he helped her with that or, or or um or it was jordan peterson who said in his conversation with bishop robert Barron. you know anyway point is You've got people kind of vying for him. And sometimes you're like, okay, do you want his good or do you want him on your team so you can feel more secure? And maybe talk about how that's a frustrating thing. <laughs> like yeah. I'm sure you've received this both from Catholics and Orthodox who are trying to like bait you in in a way that doesn't actually seem like they have your good in mind. They just want you on their team. I mean, you said it pretty well. There's that. Then you wonder for some people, is it 
I'm not sure about my team. And if you come in, then maybe that'll make me a little more sure, you know, yeah. especially when things are so uh, tumultuous. Yeah. Um, I think that's a big, a big part of it. I think also it's, hey, if we just get like in Jordan Peterson, as an example, if we just get this guy, everybody else will come in. Mm. So it's almost like maybe, you know, to put myself in his shoes, does it feel like, do you want me to be a part of this home or do you just want me to be like your, your warrior, you know, your front lines guy? That's perhaps part of it. Yeah. Um, then there's this question, because I, I remember specifically asking you one time, which was super melodramatic. Where I said, if I become a Catholic, do you promise to take care of me? <laughs> and it's like, did I answer? You called me and you said, can you come down right now? <laughs> and I said, I cannot. <laughs> but um, where it's almost like you wonder, okay, all these people are saying, come home, come home, come yeah. home. Okay, what if I walk through that door and then you, and then you're not there for me? Mm. You know, um, because that's only part of the journey. Like. I keep thinking now when I, when I land, God willing, very soon, what happens next? I've been praying about this for five years. What do I pray about after this? Mm. You know, I've, I've been trying to fit in somewhere. So it's almost like discerning marriage for 10 years, getting married and then, oh, wow, now it begins. Now we have to live together. Yeah. Now I have to see, do you sleep with the door open or shut? Do you, how do you brush your teeth? How do you chew your food? Yeah. Now we're part of the same household. You know, how are you going, how are you going to love me when I'm in there? Mm. You know, and and that's, that's something to think about, um, for sure. But there is, I, I know like, um, uh, Austin gospel simplicity talks yeah. about, he did a couple of videos on, um, Catholicism and orthodoxy and his thoughts thus far. Yeah. And, and he talks about the, the deep psychological impact of people saying, just come home. Like, yeah, I want to be home. Who doesn't? Right. And, um, so it, it's very unhelpful to people to make an objective discernment of where is the truth and where do I belong because everybody wants to be home and home is such a fluid, weird thing. Now people aren't stationary, you know? So does home mean, Oh, come in for two years and then go do something else. And, uh, or, or, you know, what, yeah. what does that mean? And, um, and it's also weird, you know, you have all of these people that are, are they, you know, like, as you said, want you on their team, but it's, it's funny. Like people will say, like I was talking to somebody once and I said, you know, I just don't believe in Catholic theology on certain points. And, um, but the people, that's okay. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're like, oh, he's like, no. well, I know plenty of people who have just been loved into the kingdom. And I'm like, okay, but you're telling me like a faithful Catholic has to submit to these things. But if I can't submit to them, you're still telling me to join the church. Like, wouldn't isn't yeah. that wouldn't that actually be a sin on my part? Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, um, kind of. Yeah. So, what is the real motivation? Right, like, do you want right. me there because I believe it's true, or do you just want me there because it's your your thing? Yeah. Uh, mm. So that's that's weird. Yeah, it's tough. I think you. Uh, I I don't know about you, but I find that whenever whenever I'm able to really express how I feel. And, and as I'm saying it, I'm terrified because I don't see how it ends. There's no bow to wrap up, up on it, but, but I'm just honest. What I find is that impacts people the most, you know, and I think what you're doing today just in sharing this journey is doing that. It's like, yep, no bow. This is it. The end. There's no end. I don't know where I am. It's, yeah, you're, you're voicing a lot of people's concerns because, I mean, part of it is we live in, like, a chaotic society where – we don't know what the hell's happening. We don't know. I mean, how long is America still existing? Is it still a thing? Oh, it is. Okay. But we'll see how long that lasts. Like we come from broken homes. We're in a broken country. We're in a confusing church. We desperately want certainty because we can't live in chaos. No one can live in chaos, which is, I think, what leads people into those fringes of ortho bros, rad trads, sure. Calvinist, whatever they are, you know, that kind of fringe of the Protestant movement online. And these seem to be the ones... And, and, and I don't want people to misunderstand me. I'm not accusing anyone in particular. And I know terms can be used differently. I'm not saying you go to a traditional uh, Catholic parish, then that's you. That's not what I'm saying. But I think we've all experienced that kind of anger and that kind of um, self-righteousness in those sort of groups who are on the peripheries, desperately trying to make everything calm and safe and, and, and certain again. You make things <coughs> certain by calling everyone a heretic. Well, like two things that just occurred to me as you're saying that. Like, okay, so one... <laughs> One is also tying in to everything. So there's this idea too that people are saying like, 
you know, when you come into the church, whichever it may be, it should be this joyful, beautiful occasion. Yes, it will be. But there's also going to have to be this this kind of solemn joy about it. And uh, I read this book a long time ago. It's a, a Catholic book called uh, Poverty of Spirit by Johannes Metz. Mm. I think you, ha- you need to read it. It's, it's short. It's beautiful. But he's talking about decision making. And he says something along the lines of to make any decision at all is to sacrifice the thousand, the potentiality of any mm-hmm. of the thousands of other options that, that laid yep, before you yep, prior yep. to that. Spot on. Yeah. So it's like, there are all of these potentialities for me in Catholicism and Orthodoxy, things that I could do for the kingdom and things that I would benefit from either church. I have to sacrifice one of those two things. At this point, I've spent enough time with both and fallen in love with both to different degrees mm. that I have to I have to be partially brokenhearted when I enter whichever one I enter, which, you know, again, I don't want to... I'll, well, I'll leave that. But... Um, so that's a part of it. But the other thing too, um, yeah, crap. I forgot if I can just pick up, I'm tired of people like psychoanalyzing everybody that bothers me. You know, like if, if we see somebody bending a particular way that isn't where we are at, like, oh, well, yeah, see, he just didn't want to. You know, right. He just wanted to go along. Uh, this isn't. I'm not speaking about you here. I know. But someone might say he just wants to use contraception, right? Or the atheist who doesn't become a theist. He just wants to sin. It's like maybe, but what the hell do you know? Have he we just been wants told to, he not goes to judge men because he just wants to remain Protestant. He doesn't yeah. want to pay. He doesn't want yeah. to submit to a pope. Yeah. And it's like, well, and the same thing. Like he, he's just becoming Catholic because things will be easier for him. Like he said, and we all knew that he's being a coward. It's like we, we, we don't. Yeah, we have no idea what's going on in other people's hearts and minds. And this is a difficult, bloody thing at times. And I remember the other thing I was going to say. And it's kind of in line with when you had Ralph Martin on. Yeah. He was talking, he said, orthodoxy is not enough. And I was thinking about that. <clears throat> so everything that I said that I believe about orth- about capital O orthodoxy, <clears throat> that it's, yeah. it's apostolic. Yep. It's, uh, some may disagree. I, I believe that it has Catholicity to it. Okay. I believe that it has orthodoxy and doctrine. I believe that it has orthopraxy, you know, all of those things are not enough. If I'm not like Christ, like, you know, right. We, if I have all the right beliefs, I can go to hell. Right. Yeah. Cause I mean, for, I that's first Corinthians, yeah. right? Yeah. You do all these things without love. Yeah. You're nothing. Yeah. So it's like, where do I go to be most in a disposition of being able to love and, and exist like Christ, like Christ likeness is really all that matters. People will say, okay, so all these other things, all these other doctrines and expressions are, these are vehicles by which you get to Christ likeness. Um, I, I agree with that, you know, but they in and of themselves are not, they're not it. Christ is it. Mm. Christ is in all and all are in Christ and he is all, mm. you know, and why aren't why is that not our our foremost thought process? It's well, are you Catholic? Are you Orthodox? Is are you like Christ? Mm. You know, uh, and maybe mm. that's some ethereal hippie n- crap. I don't no, know. No. Well, whatever it is, there's truth to it. Yeah, you can carve away as much from that statement as you want. You'll still be left with a true statement. Like, so I hear. You. Yeah, yeah. Why don't we take a break and come back? Is that cool, Neil? Mm-hmm. I'm really glad he said yes.
I would like to talk about Hallo and thank Hallo for sponsoring this episode. Oh, there's no coffee left. Neil. <laughs> Damn it, Neil. Okay. <laughs> Hallo is a really great app that will help you to pray. It's a prayer and meditation app. There are a ton of uh, mindfulness sort of apps out there. What's one of them? Calm? That would be one. Sure. I don't know. There's others. I don't listen to hip hop. Not even <clears throat> worth mentioning the others. Yeah, please. But Hallow is a really fantastic app. And so I would check, invite you to download it. It'll uh, lead you in the rosary. It'll help you with uh, praying through scripture. It has sleep stories. Some of them are read by, well, yours truly, but you don't have to listen to that one if it just aggravates you. But you can listen to Father Mike Schmitz, Jonathan Rumi. There's a ton of great content on the Hallow app. That's H-A-L-L-O-W. Now, you can download the Hallow app right now, Android, iOS, obviously, whatever, and you'll get some of the content. You might want to do that just to check it out. But if you want access to the entire app for free for a month so you can really give it a fair shake, go to hallow.com slash Matt, I think, or hallow.com slash Matt Frad. Either way, we're going to have the, the, link, l- is the-, the link is in the description below. <laughs> hallow.com slash Matt, maybe? We'll look it up. Matt, so, maybe. Matt, we mentioned the other uh, meditation apps. So what's wrong? Where should we do? Thank Hallow. you, Neil. Thank you, Neil. Okay, so why you should check out Hallo instead of these other meditation apps. I think a lot of people are finding themselves anxious because they can't decide between orthodoxy and Catholicism. Well, one thing you could do is pot. No, not pot. One thing you could do is download the Hallo app because that'll actually help you to meditate and pray and it's really beautiful. I actually would use, I'd go into adoration. I'd feel kind of guilty about this because it felt wrong, but I would put my earbuds in and just pray through like a 20 minute meditation and it would just guide you through a kind of a prayer experience. So one of the reasons you get Hallow instead of one of these other things is it's 100% Catholic. None of this new age business. Hallow.com slash Matt. The link's in the description. It's uh, Matt Brad. <laughs> okay, there we go. Hallow.com slash Matt Brad. Hallow.com slash Matt Brad. <laughs> Click on it. Get it. They'll be happy with me. I'll be happy that they're happy with me and everything will be okay. I've used it quite a bit. Have you really? Mm-hmm. Hmm. I wish. They had the Jesus prayer? Just no. any Eastern yeah. I mean, there's stuff that's, that's like too much a, to ask. A common, you know, but put your Sagian prayers. Mm. Throw an Akathist hymn on there. They'll do it. They'll do it. They'll hear it. They'll do it. Yeah, it's already done. But did you like it as a, yeah. as an app? It's oh, a yeah. really. You know what's funny is you only have to start to create a website or create an app to realize how bloody hard it is and how much money it takes. Anyway, how you doing? Good. What are we gonna do after this? I don't know. <laughs> What do you want to do? I kind of want to get lunch. Yeah, do you but, know? But, you know, to your point, like, I was actually thinking about that when you said when you choose something, you necessarily, like, reject other things. And that's kind of what keeps us perpetually open to, say, marriage or God or Catholicism or whatever. But it's like just like lunch. Like, you and I have to choose something for lunch, right. even though there are a lot of options. Like, we could drive to Robinson. We could go into Pittsburgh. We could hang here. There's two options in Steubenville. But we could go elsewhere, right? <laughs> And whatever we choose, we have to reject others. And And we might be disappointed by the one we choose. Exactly. Or get food poisoning and die. (laughs) In Steubenville. No, that's not true. (laughs) Yogos is the bomb. So are you kind of looking forward to finally making a decision here? Like, it sounds like you're about to land. Yeah, but I'm also terrified of that, you know? Like, what happens if I, uh, like, I think in my mind, you know, magically, you know, the chris the, the chrism dries and i'm just solid as a rock i'm not going to change my mind again and i do plan obviously to fully commit yeah. and be all in yeah but what happens if i wake up the next day and i think oh man i still don't, you know that's funny it's not funny that's terrifying uh, i mean I, I have a friend who recently got an annulment um because she was in a very manipulative relationship with a dude and she was also part of this like prayer group and even though she didn't want to marry him these people were saying, no, we, you are being called to this. Ugh. And the fact that you don't want to marry him is just the devil. You'll realize that once you have the grace of the sacrament, this is all these sorts of things that they told Dude, her. Dude, I hear that same kind of stuff. So <laughs> what, my point is she got married. She goes and she sits in the, in the limo and he sits down and he looks at her. He's like, hello, wife. And she was just like, whoops, horrified. Yeah. Now, thank God that wasn't a marriage. So she got an annulment and she's with a beautiful man right now and three beautiful kids. But it's like, that's cut to your point, not to make you scared, more scared, but that's no. the feeling you're kind of referring oh, that's to. That's definitely right? a thing I get. Like people are saying, oh, you know, if you don't want to become a Catholic, it's because you're obstinate and hard hearted. And if you just really, if you just get in and you receive the Eucharist, mm. then you'll, you'll understand all of it. It's fine. And it's like, man, that's a, 
That's a really manipulative that's a, thing to say. That's a tough sell. I mean, but both sides do it too. It's like, you know, you'll never have the orthodox mind until you're chrismated and you're participating in the sacramental liturgical life. And I mean, sure, I, I believe there's truth to that on probably both sides. But, but this feeling of like, you know, trying to figure things out, trying to grow. I mean, in some, some sense, it won't feel much different. It's like if you just be Catholic, then you'll be Catholic. It's like, yeah. wow, man, thanks. I never thought of that. You know? so. But yeah, like it probably will be that. You'll become Orthodox or you might become Catholic and then you'll wake up and you will feel that same sort of, there's still a ton to learn, ton to grow in, ton of sin to shed, ton of virtue to obtain. Like I think about all this stuff and all the theological effort that I've put into it, but like I've never done something as simple as go to sacramental confession. I know. I'm so excited for you. Like that. That's probably the thing I'm, one of the things I'm most excited about. Yeah. You know? But it's like, I haven't, I haven't walked, I haven't walked in those shoes yet. So. Yeah. Yeah. Is it part of you that's just like, okay, I just need to make a choice, even if I'm right or wrong, so I can receive Eucharist <laughs> and confession. Sometimes, Sometimes maybe yeah. I feel that way. Yeah. I have a lot of respect for you. I mean, this has been a brutal thing. And as you say, like you left a job to do this and you're still kind of. That's just, that's just, that's tough, man. God bless you. And that's been the weird thing. It's like I've interviewed, I interviewed at a Catholic school and I told him I was discerning between the two and they were like, well, uh, when you become Catholic, call us and maybe we can have a job for you, you yeah, know, or yeah. like, um, and you, that's the you thing. You applied like, for that job as an Orthodox priest too, right? And you were like, well, I might become Catholic yeah. and they're like, that's just not going to be true. <laughs> it's not going to fly. Um, then that's a weird thing too, is like this imposition of, oh, well, now you're going to be a priest. You were a pastor, you're going to be a priest. And it's like, oh gosh, that's terrifying. Um, so I have to consider that. Like, mm. And it's weird, you know, I don't know what it is, but I think I might as well have had no work history for the past five or six years. Like, I feel like people look at my resume when I apply to secular jobs and they say, I mean, the culture, maybe this is me being cynical, but the culture is not very... Uh, Youth pastor, uh, yeah. youth pastor. That's oh wow, fantastic. how you were a babysitter, you know? Yeah. Um, or it's like, oh, you were a pastor and now you're not. And you're applying for this secular job. Like, what? What happened? What did you do? What did you do? <laughs> What's wrong with you? You know, you couldn't hack it. Mm. So that makes it even more difficult, I think. But um, yeah, I don't know. Trying to learn what I can about fatherhood and sacrifice and patience. I've been stay-at-home dad mostly for the last year and a half god bless you and uh by far the most difficult position i've ever held mm -hmm. the most rewarding beautiful except and, um, it isn't no, I'm just no I'm, and i love I'm it you know it's it's weird but that does something to your thoughts of like your own manhood and mm. uh you know you want to provide for your family and right that, obviously you know people are saying like oh well you're at home while your wife's working because you're a beta male. And Do people say that? No. I hate people. Yeah. People nobody's, are, nobody's if I was Jesus, I would not have died for us. <laughs> You've told me that. <laughs> also, new new internet rule that people don't know. If you're a dude who calls another dude a beta male, you are not just a beta male yourself, but no doubt a pale-faced basement-dwelling frequent masturbator. Yeah, that's, that's or, a new rule. Or I've Because I don't know any <laughs> alpha male. I don't know anybody who's like, I'm comfortable with my masculinity, who goes around the internet with four subscribers and a profile pic of a crusader tearing down <laughs> other men. Like, yeah, I don't, don't know any man who's confident in masculinity who does that. So that's yeah. the new rule. You're a dude. You call someone a beta male. You, that's, that's unfortunately. I know, I know you are, but what am I? Yes, you that's a good I mean? one too. I don't know if you've ever heard that. Or do you remember that? Like, what are you looking at? I don't know. I don't have my animal book. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> like, if I had my animal book, I could oh. be like, giraffe. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else, Neil? Are we good? <laughs> I think we're, we're good yet. Yeah, do we want to do Patreon questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what we're going to do now, and we're going to try to do this every single time we do an interview or a debate, is we are going to be taking uh, supporter questions from locals and patrons, and that video will only be available to our supporters. So if you're considering supporting us, please do that. We need your support. Patreon.com slash Matt Frad or Locals. You can choose which one you want to give through. It's both the same to me. But if you go to pintswithaquinas.com slash give, you'll see those two options. Give to us in one way or the other. The other thing we've been doing every weekday morning is morning coffee over on Locals. So we'll put a link in the description below. We just chat. It's like a new podcast we're doing. You don't have to subscribe. You don't have to pay to watch it. Anyone can watch it. I'll be there. And Derek will be there. He's there most mornings, splamming his coffee. 
Riding the brown dragon. And let us know what you think of that like intro music we played today from Emma Frad. All right, thanks. See ya. Bye. <laughs>